the market's been enjoying the sunshine over the last few weeks, and I don't think that's going to last. We're still reeling from the unevenness of both the reopening, the supply chain disruptions. You know, an economy is still kind of moving beyond the pandemic. I think the market probably does not move materially higher from here. I think 4,300 will likely continue to be a resistance. We think it's probably going to be growth that surprises us on the downside. We are going to come out of this COVID crisis with a K-shaped recovery. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. The week begins right now, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with the brilliant Kelly Lines. Bramo taking the rest of this week off, TK. That was Futures brilliant. down a half of 1% on the S&P. TK, a little bit later this morning, retail sales in America, some yeah. target earnings. <clears throat> then later, it's the Fed minutes. I'm not going to mince words. Target earnings will be interesting, but I'm not going to mince words, John. Do we put an equal weight on retail sales as we did on inflation and on the jobs report? in the distant past? And my answer is yes, we do. It's the spirit of 70% of the American economy and the nuances of it will be important. It is a nominal read on retail sales, Tom. And yes. I think we have to strip out gas spending as well. <clears throat> Just a couple of things to think about when that number drops well, it's at 8.30 Eastern. Yeah, yeah, it's nominal. It's really important. Nominal in the United States has a certain tinge to it. John, nominal in the United Kingdom has oh, a certain tinge Tom, to it. Tom, double-digit inflation. Yeah, it's here. Oh, wow. And this Bank of England has got some work to do. And then part of it, John, I've been spending the whole morning on this, folks, doing conversions with Will Kennedy and Javier Bloss on how you talk about this stuff in English. And the answer, John, is the biggest fear here for all, including Prime Minister Truss, is the idea of the duration, the persistency of this double-digit inflation. The idea it's going to go up and come down, I'm not so sure. Kelly, all these central banks have got more work to do, <clears throat> yeah. including the Federal Reserve. We get the Fed minutes a little bit later. In the face of this, this equity market has rallied aggressively. I've got UBS saying, don't chase this. I've got City saying, sell into further strength. There is just a wall of doubt that this market keeps climbing over. Yeah, because this market is now betting on a dovish pivot from the Federal Reserve that Federal Reserve officials themselves have said is not coming. So I wonder when we get the minutes today, even though they are backward looking and so much has changed since that July meeting in terms of inflation cooling down and some of the other data points we've gotten, including that jobs report, is this a Fed that underneath the surface is really that much more hawkish despite some of the dovish messaging maybe that was accidentally conveyed by Jerome Powell at the press conference? Does that have the power to shift the tone in this equity market that just keeps running? Three day winning streak on the S&P up by about 17 and a half percent from the lows of this year from New York this morning. Morning. Good morning. Here's the price action on the S&P. We're down about five or six tenths of one percent. The data coming out a little bit later, as I say, 8.30 Eastern time. Katie's going to run you through the numbers and what to look for in just a moment. Nasdaq futures down seven tenths of one percent. Yields are higher on a 10 year in America by six basis points to 286.76. And I can tell you, Katie, yields are much, much higher in the gilt market in the UK. They are flying, especially at the short end, up more than 20 basis points on the two year yield. And that gilt curve between twos and tens is at its most inverted since the year 2000. Massive, massive moves in the UK bond market. I wonder how much we'll get movement more in the Treasury market today when we get that economic data. But before we get there, we do have more earnings. You and Tom already mentioned it. Target will be crossing the wire around 6.30 a.m. Eastern. And remember, like Walmart, Target has also lowered its own bar. Twice now it has lowered its guidance, talking about margin pressure due to inflation and consumers pivoting more towards spending on oil and gas. Yet Walmart was able to jump over that lower bar. It says its earnings aren't going to be down as much as they previously stated. So to what extent does that read through to Target as it's down 22% on a year-to-date basis? Of course, one of the things Walmart talked about yesterday was because gas prices have moved lower, consumers have been able to reroute their spending toward more discretionary items. And to what extent will that be borne out in retail sales data at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time? What we're looking for on the headline is up just a tenth of a percent month on month. X auto and gas, though, up four tenths of one percent. So how much do lower prices at the pump impact the behavior of the American consumer? That is the backbone of the U.S. economy. And of course, the Federal Reserve is going to look at this data. It will uh, inform 
its conversations at Jackson Hole next week and of course the September meeting and we may get more insight into what exactly the Fed was thinking about the move in September when the minutes come at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Yes, a lot has changed since that July meeting, but when they hiked 75 basis points, were they thinking they need to do it again? And does the hawkish narrative, the resolve to fight inflation, kind of push back on the idea that the market has now, which is a dovish pivot, John? Kelly, thank you. Never mind the Fed minutes. I think we're all looking ahead to Chairman Powell at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for some real guidance into the September Fed meeting. We've seen this movie a few times this week. Futures negative, and then we squeeze out a day of gains. This morning again, futures negative, five six tenths of one percent. Joining us now is Marvin Lowe, senior global macro strategist at State Street. Marvin, would you chase this rally? No, no. I, I think we were talking about it before the show began. Um, a lot has been priced in. I, I, I wouldn't chase it at this point. Um, I think a lot of good news and a lot of soft landing has been um, effectively <laughs> reflected in kind of where valuations have gone over the last six weeks or so. But Marvin, part of that is the idea that corporations adapt, whether it's use of cash, it's the dynamics of capital expenditures, and particularly the mix of revenue as well. Are you suggesting we pause here or pull back because corporations are done with wiggle room? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a pause is, is, is probably a better way of looking at it from my perspective. Um, companies have a lot of flexibility. Companies have a lot of power within that balance sheet. And we have to remember that an S&P company is not necessarily the same as a general business within the United States. Um, you've also got the relative aspects of the U.S. economy relative to the rest of the world. Um, but in terms of valuations and what you're, what you're buying in terms of a forward perspective, there's a lot priced in. And there really is a lot of um, expectations that the market feels it knows what the path of the Fed is going to be over the course of the next three to six months, when it stops and when it starts to cut. And I think that that is um, potentially a concern for me in that it's still somewhat unclear because this inflation story is still evolving. Yeah, well, Marvin, it strikes me that a lot of this narrative shifting toward a dovish Fed pivot has coincided with an earnings season that by and large also has been a lot better than expected. You're seeing surprises on both the top and bottom line consistently. And I wonder how much of this actually is fundamental and not too much optimism being priced in now, but too much pessimism being priced in before. Yeah, I, I, I'm in the camp that we had too much pessimism going into, into the second quarter report, reporting season. Almost by definition, when you have inflation that's, that's you know, too high, you've got companies that have pricing power. They're able to increase, um, increase prices, which ultimately keeps that inflation number high and keeps that narrative going out there. It's really once we get to uh, a much more significant slowing in the economy that the companies start to reevaluate what their business models look like over the course of the next 12 months or so. Um, and to me, it's, it's the third quarter, which obviously historically has been one of the more volatile periods of the equity market because we start really thinking about what the next year looks like. Marvin, every day I put out the research and just a couple of quotes from each bank. And I've put out the research from the likes of UBS and Citi in the last 12 hours or so. UBS saying don't chase the rally. Citi saying maybe sell into the strength. And here's the pushback, Marvin. Let me share it with you. Market leaders explaining to their clients why they missed the trade. Translation, we missed the bottom. We'd like to join the party, albeit a bit lower. Marvin, you see there the doubt, the skepticism that people have. Once you get about 18% yeah. into the move off the bottom, it feels like the spring of 2020 again, where people kept coming on programs like this and saying, we haven't seen the lows, we're going to retest the lows, we're going to retest the lows, and then the market's another 20% down the road. Marvin, why is this not spring 2020? Um, you know, for, for, first off, you, you clearly have the monetary authorities doing the exact opposite of what they were doing at that point. So you had a very supportive market for financial assets back in 2020. Um, the uncertainty that we have now is, is very different than the uncertainty that we had kind of back in 2020 also, where um, it, it's, it's not a function of science kind of driving this. It's really just the economic cycle. And, from, and for the most part, um, while the central banks have moved in the direction that they've wanted, they really haven't gotten any of the end results that they want, which is which is um, a demonstrably and stably lower inflation environment and a jobs market that um, has some of the froth that's taken off uh, off of it. And that's not just in the U.S. It's global. So you've got this global push moving to a tightening perspective, which really will continue to move forward, as we've seen with some of the recent central banks that continue to hike at at least a 50 basis point kind of cadence. And somehow financial conditions keep easing in the face of yeah. all of that. Marvin, awesome to catch up. Marvin Lowe there. TK, I think Thank that you. sums up the current debate for a lot of people.
It's a huge debate, John, and, and it's a nuance, and I would suggest we're starting to see a give and take, a back and forth of maybe the Uber bears reining it in a little bit and the Uber bulls saying, well, that was nice, now what? But to me, it's just about uncertainty, and part of that's going to be solved with retail sales this morning at 8.30. All, we're, John, we're all data dependent. I mean, Elon Musk is data dependent. <laughs> He's got to look at Manu and say, does he buy at the bottom or does he buy later on? Hey, Tom, wouldn't it be nice to be able to be joking <laughs> about buying a football club in the premiership and then the stock market reacts to it because it's not sure whether you're John, serious or John, not? Well, Wouldn't John, it be nice to be I, that rich? John, I'm so large that after my third beverage of my choice tonight, maybe I'll put out a tweet. Mr. Levy, I, I need to buy, I need the tots. The t you know. TK's buying <laughs> Tottenham. Tottenham just don't know about it yet. Man United <laughs> in the pre-market up by more than 3%. Katie, I'll read the tweet. And also, I'm buying Manchester United. You're welcome. Elon Musk about 10 hours ago. Someone replied, are you serious? No. This is a long-running <laughs> joke on Twitter. I'm not buying any sports teams. He goes on to say, although if it were any team, it would be Man U. They were my favourite team as a kid. There's only one man that can do this and right. get that kind of reaction. It's just ridiculous sometimes. That's the thing is, even if you're joking, he is well aware of his power to move a market in a massive way. And he is well aware that there are, he has a cult following in some sense among traders who might actually take him seriously and make moves off what he said. My thing, John, is he's gotten in trouble for this before. What happened to his Twitter sitter? Is anyone still uh, checking the, the tweets he sends out? I have no out? idea whether that tweet got a check. I'll say this, though. I think it complicates the well, matter when it's a public <clears throat> company, Tom. Yeah, that, it's not that's a private what one. We, we need to be clear company. here. It's not like the Boston Red Sox. The Manchester United is a publicly traded company. And we've got a move this yeah. morning of a little more than 3%. We'll pick up on that a little bit later. Tom, we also need to talk about Congresswoman Cheney as well. We'll head down to D.C. Yes. in just a moment. Coming up in the next hour, we'll catch up with Gagi Chowdhury of BlackRock, what she thinks is happening with the inflation backdrop and what she thinks she should do in this market. Yields are higher by six basis points on a 10-year, 286.94. Futures are down six-tenths of 1% from New York. For our audience worldwide, Bramo away, Kaylee in with Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerens. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has warned civilians to stay away from military facilities occupied by Russian forces. That followed explosions at a Russian ammo dump in Crimea. An advisor to Zelensky has said the blast marked the beginning of a series of attacks. Last week, explosions at a Russian airbase in Crimea destroyed fighter jets. Here in the UK, inflation jumped more than expected last month to the highest level in 40 years. The consumer price index rose 10.1% in July from a year ago, following a 9.4% gain in June. That will put pressure on the British government and the Bank of England to take action. Germany will struggle to have enough natural gas to get through the winter. That is according to the country's energy regulator, which says Germany will have enough gas for less than three months if Russia cuts off supplies completely. The country is racing to fill its winter stockpiles after Russia drastically reduced flows on the key Nord Stream pipeline. In Wyoming, Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney has called on Americans to prevent Donald Trump from winning the White House again. Cheney suffered a crushing defeat to a primary challenger back behind the former president. She had become an outcast in her own party for her strong anti-Trump stance. The world's largest sovereign wealth fund has lost $174 billion in the first half of the year. That is more than a 14% loss for the Norwegian fund. Interest rate hikes, inflation and Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to market volatility. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. about to sign the Inflation Reduction Act into law, one of the most significant laws in our history. Let me say from the start, with this law, the American people won and the special interests lost.
We'll pick up on that in just a moment. That was the President of the United States from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Katie Lyons. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Lisa back with us next week. Futures down six tenths of one percent on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq down about seven tenths of one percent. A little bit later this morning, about 12 minutes from now, we'll get some earnings from Target. Then ahead from there, in about two hours after that, we'll get some retail sales numbers out of America. Then on to Fed minutes <coughs> a little bit later. Tom, we've got to talk about the politics of Wyoming. The Republican yes. representative Liz Cheney losing her GOP primary in a way that we anticipated, Tom. She's now going to front a new organization, this from Politico. What she lost versus what she gained. Cheney lost her seat but gained something else. She is now the undisputed leader of the so-called Trump opposition. I like the, the organization. I don't know what that means. Maybe it's pretty opaque. I think there's two great mysteries to Jackson Hole. One is, is John, is John Farrell going to wear Lucchese or Tony Lama boots? And the other is, when we attend Jackson Hole next week, and the other is, exactly what is Liz Cheney's Wyoming? Anne-Marie Horton joins us here, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. And Anne-Marie, I thought the Washington Post this, this morning, with tongue planted firmly in cheek, had Karen Heller talking about the fabulously wealthy of Wyoming. We all have our stereotypes. What did Liz Cheney lose last night in the fabulously wealthy Wyoming? It's the money's mind boggling. Well, she lost her seat, right? The seat her father also held in the 70s, one she had. This is their lone house seat, right? So she is not going to be coming back to Washington in that capacity. But as Jonathan said, she's going to be. And by the yeah. way, she still has about $7 million left over of campaign finances. Okay. Well, so do you. That's, but potentially, Henry, <laughs> that's what, potentially the money she's going to be using to launch this but, uh, new party. But you nailed it. Organization. Her Wyoming is not her father's Wyoming. What did she actually lose last night? To me, it's an exceptionally affluent state. Am I right on that? Yeah, it is an affluent state. But as we talked about yesterday, Tom, and even though you had some Democrats switching their party lines with their registration to vote in this primary so they can back her because of her staunch defiance against Donald Trump and her criticism of the former president. You had people switching over. There were actual Democrats in some of the liberal parts, which are fair and few between, to vote for her in this primary. But this is a state that voted 70 percent. That is how much President Donald Trump picked up in the 2020 election, 70 percent of the state. Yeah. So now you have him backing um, Harriet Hageman. So so it was very, very obvious this was all but pretty much set in stone that she was going to lose this primary because this is a state that is staunch Republican and they also are staunch Trump supporters. Emory, why is Alaska different? Obviously, this is in part a repercussion from Liz Cheney voting to impeach President Trump after January 6th. So did Lisa Murkowski, and yet she's advancing mm -hmm. to the general. And I just wonder what that difference is and why her punishment on the part of voters hasn't been as severe. I think there's two reasons why. One is that it's very obvious that pre uh, former President Trump really took aim at Liz Cheney. That is where all of his firepower was coming towards, and that is where he really, really wanted to make sure that she was ousted. We also talked about the fact that this is heavily Trump country, right? And also, Liz Cheney did something different than we saw from Senator Murkowski, which is Liz Cheney right now is the leading Republican on the select committee investigating the president and the insurrection of January 6th. But also in Alaska, you have a different kind of ballot. So even though Senator Murkowski right. is going through, you're also going to have the Trump backer, uh, Kelly Chewbacca, also going through because what they have is a ranking system. So if your first candidate choice gets knocked out in the general election, your vote goes to the second or third of your ranking choice. So it's a little bit different in terms of logistics, but I also think with Liz Cheney, it was definitely more personal. We all need to hear these numbers. David Gura <laughs> shared this out on Twitter. It was a University of Wyoming poll that found of the likely voters who support Ms. Hageman, only 16% believe that the 2020 presidential election was legitimate, compared to 94% of Ms. Cheney's supporters. And Marie, how is that one issue going to shape the midterms and potentially the next election? Well, you're seeing it play out now, right, as you have the former president under investigation for a number of issues. Right now, of course, all the focus, especially tomorrow, we'll have this hearing from a judge in Florida about whether or not they're going to release this affidavit in terms of the investigation of Mar-a-Lago. 
All of this goes back to these unfounded claims from the former president saying the 2020 election was not stolen. And how this shapes the midterms is some Republicans are really going to lean in that, while Democrats are going to say, as Liz Cheney was saying in her concession speech last night, that this is the fight for freedom about democracy of the United States. It's also likely going to be one of the hooks that the former president uses if he is going to make his bid for 2024, which many do expect. That 2022, in his words, was a sham, so he wants to come back. MH, I've got to squeeze this in just on policy. We played that clip of the president saying this was a win over special interests. I was just thinking of Senator Cinema, and I was just sitting there thinking, really, when I watched him say that yesterday, Anne-Marie, was that really a win over special interests? It's the first thing I thought, too, because obviously you had a provision to close the carried loophole tax, which makes sure that at a lower rate you have venture capitalists and hedge fund managers taxed much lower than they would on their income that we all pay normal taxes on. So while there's some good things in there, the president is going to tout for seniors and climate provisions, there is still the carried interest loophole for the most wealthy in this country. So it was a little bit uh, ironic that the president would say that this was closing the gap on special interest. It was a strange thing to lead with. Let's just put it that way. Anne-Marie, thank you. AMH down in D.C. One thing we can all agree on, Tom, it was a win for this White House, signing that bill, taking that pen and <clears> handing <throat> it over to Senator Manchin, standing alongside him. It's a win, and in traditional politics of another time and place, John, I guess you drive that forward with a lot of careful bow tie analysis. I'm not sure it works this time. But what's important here is Mr. Biden needs a series of wins, and maybe he's getting them in a clumsy way as we get to this midterm. I haven't seen any writings yet that it really tilts the change, but he's tightened things up. There's no question he's about that. He's getting them slightly Tom. Yeah. And gas is a part of that story, too. We'll discuss Huge that part. a little bit later. Huge Are we going to talk about the analysis of cowboy boots? Two brands that you named that <clears throat> I've never heard of. <laughs> well, John, you know, you, you, you got to, there's some nuances here. I mean, Tony Lama's got the two tones. You can get the custom boots, though, yeah, John. That means I, nothing to me. I see you more, you know, I, I, I can see, you know, Bezos has got like four million acres somewhere. Do the Gucci lace ups <laughs> work, Tom? <laughs> no, the Gucci. Tom no, the, the, wants to go no, south of no. 59th Street to Soho and go shopping. Tom's wearing a Prada right now. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> Luke, Seriously, John. people think I'm joking. He is. John, you want the Lucchese low heels like I wear in, in the wonderful Don Imus okay. wears. I've you're, got no idea what they you are. You don't trip over your guitar cable with low heels versus high heels. There you go. There's your pro tip. Okay, we've settled that one. Thanks, Tom. This is Bloomberg. got a few things to get through this morning. Target earnings coming up any moment from now. Then after that, retail sales in about two hours in America. Coming into all of that, futures negative six tenths of one percent on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq 100, down about eight tenths of one percent. That's the equity story for futures on the Nasdaq and the S&P. Here's the story for Target. What a miss. EPS in at 39 cents. The estimate 72. We know these companies have got a monster inventory problem. We know that. And this stock is down by more than 4%, make it 9% now. Kaylee, they've got a massive inventory problem. Yeah. We know that. And clearly, profit is taken on the chin as they work through those issues. Yeah. And the CEO himself said it in the statement, inventory right sizing puts significant pressure on the company's near term profitability. The thing, John, is that Walmart said the same thing previously and yet was able to jump over the lowered bar, target missing even the twice lowered bar, clearly having even larger inventory issues. It is all about the balance of products as consumers pay more for food and gas and you have too much higher expense discretionary spending that is higher margin for these companies. And clearly target is just having much more difficulty navigating that the second quarter Comp sales plus 2.6%, the estimate 2.84. They still see the year revenue growth in the low to mid single digits. So at least we're not getting a cut to the outlook right now, unlike back in May 18th. Do you remember May 18th, Tom, when they came out and had to drop that one and the stock dropped yeah. by about 25%? This stock's dropping this morning, not as severely, though, off the back of this big miss. And, Tom, we know they've got this massive inventory problem and it's <clears> going to take a long time to work right. through it. Futures negative 26 on Standard & Poor's went down to negative 30 here off this announcement. John, I give them great credit for clarity of press release and buried six, seven, eight, nine ideas down. Operating margin rate of 1.2% reflected gross margin pressure. Basically, 98 cents to be charitable, 98 cents in the dollar 
is vaporizing down to making a penny or two, John. It's a tough business right now. What I'll be looking for today, Tom, is to see how resilient the stock price reaction to this news is, because <clears throat> this is news yeah. to no one. We've been talking about this for a long, long time, Tom, a number of months now. And to see the stock come back in the way it has in a pre-market, at least for now, it might change. It's now positive by a quarter of 1% after initially dropping 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 percentage points, Tom. <clears throat> we snap back. So let's see how well-priced this story yeah. actually is, given we've been talking about it for quite a while. And I'm going to give them some clarity. I'm going to give them some credit here, John. Here's a sentence. Additionally... Fall season receipts in discretionary categories re were reduced by more than $1.5 billion. I mean, I'm in Target like every 10 days or so, John. And, you know, I can see we're in clothing. They've been absolutely pounded. But you wonder how that spread over. And they've got a digital breakout where digital is actually off a little bit as well. I'm bringing the company commentary. While the company is planning cautiously for the remainder of the year, current trends support the company's prior guidance for full year revenue growth. Maybe, Tom, you can take just like a grain of confidence well, from that. It's been hard to trust <clears throat> the guidance from these okay. companies over the last few months. CFO is listening to us globally. Can you just write a press release like Target where it's in English? While the company is planning cautiously for the remainder of the year. I mean, John, it really says it You've all. You've got to be humble, Tom. You've got to be yeah. nimble. And we know that Target... <clears throat> was basically preparing the company for the demand backdrop that existed a year or so ago. And we're in a different economy now, Tom. And that's why they've got all this inventory and they've got to price down that inventory. And that's why I think mm. we're seeing this big downside surprise on EPS, TK. <clears throat> yeah, there's no question uh, about that as well. Right now, we're going to digress and move to Norway. Nikolai Tangen is chief executive officer of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. They are challenged by, as Target mentions, the uncertainty that out, is out there, and we are thrilled he joins us today uh, with an update. Nikolai, you know that on the back end of the core algebraic function is a Greek letter epsilon for uncertainty. What is the level of uncertainty your sovereign wealth fund sees as you drift to 2023? Well, I would say it's a continuation of the uncertainty we've seen for, uh, for a year or so now. Uh, it consists of uh, the inflation, the energy prices, uh, and the geopolitics. And so it's a continuation of what we've seen for some time. Well, with the, the, the situation that we're in leads to diversification. You people are, to use an American phrase, sir, ginormous. How do you diversify or choose bets given this uncertainty? Well, first of all, we have a very long-term view on what we do. So we, um, you know, invest with a kind of a, ge a generation hat on. We uh, spread over investments uh, across the world. We are um, we have ownership in nine thousand companies across the world. We have uh, both equities and bonds and real estate. So well diversified portfolio for the long term. What do you think of the American growth technology companies? Are you overweighting them? Do you own too much of them? I know the Swiss National Bank has a little bit of Apple as well, but the, is there the opportunity there in the tumult to reaffirm large cap growth? Well, these companies are, of course, uh, uh, very, very big parts of the index. And so we would have big holdings in these companies. Uh, the U.S. tech companies would typically be amongst our top 10 holdings, and, and we continue to think they are well positioned. And clearly, we have seen a bit of a recovery in the equity markets in recent weeks. Nikolai, there is a bet on the part of the markets that we're going to see a more dovish tilt from Federal Reserve. How are you positioning potentially for Fed policy, and how ultimately do you think they will react? How does that inform your decision making going forward? Well, it's a, that's a really, really tough one. We uh, came into this year with, uh, with some underweight in shares and, and uh, you know, a less risky bond portfolio. We've taken off some of that underweight, but uh, we remain uh, slightly cautious on the outlook here. Uh, you know, clearly markets don't go down in a straight line and, and we are uncertain uh, in terms of um, whether we've seen a bit of a bottoming here or, or whether we'll see a continuation of, that, of the tough market. And of course, in addition to the monetary policy picture, there's a number of risks that the market has to weigh as well, including the ongoing war in Ukraine, which is now approaching six months. Have you come to any decisions around strategies of what your end game with your Russian assets is? Well, um, when it comes to the Russian assets, we have been uh, instructed by, uh, by the government to, to exit these. 
for the time being, they they don't really trade, and also we can't be certain about where they where they end up. So um, so they are still frozen, and we um, we haven't um, sold them yet. Nicola, I'd like you to step away from the huge mass and the different responsibilities you have with your sovereign wealth fund and look at the heritage you have of hedge funds. It has been an absolute battle for hedge funds in timing the market. Obviously, they've got a much more shorter term mandate than what you have now. And then there's the question of long short and the different formulas are that. Is the alternative investment game over? Is the two and 20 game over? <laughs> well, it's a tough one to say. I mean, uh, it's over for me personally in that <clears> I now yes. work for the Southern Wealth Fund. But um, no, it's uh, it's it's difficult to say. I mean, the, the returns from that asset class goes up and down. Um, for the moment, they are having a tough time. They have previously bounced back from these type of situations. But uh, but I, I haven't really got a strong mm -hmm. view on this. I must ask, Nikolai, uh, the view from Oslo of the rest of continental Europe. I've been working through the morning on natural gas equivalencies in dollar and in Brent crude barrels that directly involves Norway. Your comments on how Norway and your investment fund will withstand what we're seeing in hydrocarbon prices. Yeah, um, now uh, energy prices are high, gas prices are high, uh, but unfortunately for some sad reasons, the, the result is that we have big inflows into the fund and we have big inflows into the fund at a time where uh, bonds and, and, and equities are cheaper than they have been. So from that point of view, that's a bit of a silver lining um, from this fund. Nikolai, always enjoy hearing from you. And what a time to hear from you as well. Difficult, complex, the future with Nikolai Tangen there, the CEO of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. I want to get back to the target news, a massive miss on EPS. And initially, the stock dropping like a rock. It comes back. It's only negative eight tenths of 1%. I'll give you the numbers and then I'll tell you the why. EPS 39 cents, the estimate 72. That's a big miss. Here's the why that we're bouncing back. I think this line from the target CFO is so, so important. We know they've been grappling with a monster inventory issue. And to get that inventory out the door, they've had to cut prices and seemingly pretty aggressively so. Here's the quote though, Tom. The vast majority of our inventory right sizing costs have already been incurred. <clears throat> yeah. We feel really good about our inventory position heading into the back half of the year. Now, yes, and I agree with the team here at Bloomberg who put this out in their leading paragraph. It puts a lot of pressure on the back half of this year for Target. But Tom, I'll say this. You've basically got the C-suite telling us that that inventory pain is essentially over. I, I agree with that. And it's somewhat what we heard from Walmart yesterday. I'm doing, John, here. This is the TRA function, folks, on the Bloomberg uh, terminal. Tar uh, Target, after the big pullback here from the 2021 peak, is clocking in 13% per year for the last decade, John. Uh, that's a pretty good number, but that's not a Target good number. And the difference here is you have a management, maybe more focused in Walmart, determined to fix it now. John, I would suggest that's what we heard, we've heard from Walmart and Target in the last 48 hours. Yes, but we've been punished, Tom, by believing believing them and taking their word for it because a couple if of weeks later... If you own later, the stock, you've been punished. You've yes. been punished and yes. we find out and Kaylee, that they have to cut the outlook yeah. again. That happened in May, it happened in June. Let's hope this is the case for them. Yeah, well, especially as they're outlining what is supposed to be a better second half, John, can they actually meet that mark? I think what's so interesting is also what the signals about the broader economy in the statement. They're talking about how they still see a healthy consumer. Walmart yesterday talking about the fact that they're seeing consumers reroute their spending back toward some of those discretionary items because of lower gas prices. How much is the fate of these companies tied to the idea that prices at the pump are going to stay lower than they were? The stock is down by about one8 percent right now. We'll stay on top of that for you. Futures are down six or seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. Tech's been a struggle the last couple of days and that's that 100 down eight tenths of one percent. Going into retail sales a little bit later this morning. Yields higher by five or six basis points to 286. I mentioned it a little bit earlier in this hour. If you want to see a move in the bond market this morning, look no further than the UK. Double digit inflation and yields higher at the front end. Tom by 19 basis points on a two year. What a move. 9% inflation is different than 11% inflation, period. It's way more than two percentage points. Futures down on the S&P with Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow together with Caddy Lines. Bramo back with us on Monday. This is Bloomberg. 
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerrans. China is warning the U.S. not to sail warships through the Taiwan Strait. The Chinese ambassador to the U.S. said Beijing views such actions as an escalation by America. The Biden administration has said it would send warships and fighter jets through the strait. That is after China responded to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan with a series of military exercises. Now, Goldman Sachs says that a deal to revive the nuclear agreement between Iran, the EU and the US is unlikely to be reached in the near term. The firm predicted that even if there is a breakthrough, additional oil from Iran won't start to flow until next year. The US is looking at Iran's response to a draft proposal of that agreement. Singapore is looking for a compromise while reviewing a colonial era law that bans sex between men. That's according to the Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong. He spoke to Bloomberg's editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite in his first interview since being endorsed as the next Prime Minister. Things that they care about, about society, societal values, about family, about marriage. So it's not about the law per se, but about these other things. And that's why, as I mentioned just now, uh, we are having this conversation even right now, engaging different groups and considering how best we might move forward in a way that will not cause deeper divisions in our society. Taiwan is the only Asian jurisdiction that legally recognizes same-sex marriages. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. I think we are running on thin ice, if I may use that term, because spare capacity is becoming scarce, and this is an issue. It's like an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. We don't want the oil markets to run on without the insurance policy. That was Haytam al there, the Secretary General of OPEC, sitting down with a good friend of mine, Manus Cranny, and it was a fantastic interview. Take a look at that on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal if you have a spare five minutes or so. From New York City this morning, good morning with Tom Keane and Kelly Lyons. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about eight tenths of one percent. Last three days, though, pretty good on the S&P 500, squeezing out three days of gains in the face of some pretty economic, some pretty bad economic news. Can we say that, Tom? I think we can. It's been yeah. pretty bad across, say, Europe, <clears throat> China. I'd throw in that empire manufacturing as well in the United States, too. Well, the hallmark back 40 years of, John, when you see a double-digit inflation in Spain, you rationalize it. You can't rationalize double-digit uh, inflation in the United Kingdom, a G7 nation, uh, without just giving pause. There's no other way. We haven't talked much about it this morning, but there's really no other story socially. The Bank of England's got to make a move off the back of that, Tom. Looking forward well, to their next meeting. Well, think of the Treasury. You saw New Zealand overnight. I think they went with yeah. 50 basis points. They're now looking at a higher peak and seeing that higher peak a little bit sooner. They're not alone. They are not yeah. alone. One of the great things we do, folks, is we do a book of the year. I made it in February. I've never done that that early. Angela Stent's Putin's World. And maybe I work up a chart of the year in August to try to stagger to December. This year it's on hydrocarbons, and it will be math checked by Javier Blas, by Will Kennedy, and probably concept checked by Emrita Sen, Director of Research at Energy Aspect. She has been lights out in giving us the elasticities of what has now become a natural gas crisis. And Rita, I want you to explain to mere mortals like myself the enormity of the surge that we've seen in natural gas in Europe, in war-torn Europe, and quite frankly, around the world as well. Well, I wouldn't call yourself a mere mortal, Tom, but there you go. I'll, I'll start with the gas question you've asked. Look, uh, like you say, I mean, gas prices, even yesterday, even as oil continued to decline, we've seen gas prices in Europe, which is TTF, and even Henry Hub in the U.S., continue to rally. Um, of course, expectations remain that, you know, with the war still going on, Russia could turn off gas, which is not our base case at all. But regardless of that, we are, you know, we, we are in a situation where demand continues to remain high. We are already seeing demand rationing in the industrial sector in Europe. Uh, we've already accounted for about 15 BCM of lost gas demand in Europe just because prices are too high. Now we are seeing industry where possible switching to oil 
to liquids essentially or to coal. So all of that is going on right now, but this is going to be a huge burden. We think as a result of high gas prices, European GDP is going to decline by 1.4% next year, which is contrary to IMFs, to a lot of consensus uh, numbers out there who are still expecting growth. But we do think the burden of high gas and oil prices will actually mean that we are going to see some steep contraction in the European economies next year. The contractions that we're going to see wrap around governments solving problems. Frankly, I've never seen a chart like I see mm -hmm. in the Bloomberg. How do the governments solve the problem of a natural gas six, seven, eight, nine standard deviation surge? What Europe has already started to talk about is the potential for rationing. Uh, they do have a plan. Again, our base case is that we will not need that because industry is already switching where yeah. possible. Um, but of course, yeah, so I think I think but ultimately it does boil down to rationing potentially even at the residential level now before the winter so that we can save up uh, enough gas for the winter. And Risa, gas is climbing. We see that in Europe in a big way in the last couple of days. Crude isn't. And yet you've got the OPEC Secretary General sitting down with yeah. Manus Cranny and telling him that we've got an issue with spare capacity. Now, Marita, if that's the case, what are we doing in the 80s on WTI and the low 90s in Brent? Oh, look, I couldn't agree uh, with His Excellency, the new Secretary General Moore. You know, we're good friends and we've been talking about this and he has highlighted this time and time again that OPEC Plus doesn't have spare capacity. We've been saying that for 18 months. I mean, um, he talked about running on thin ice. Completely agree with that. We've got about 2 million barrels per day, we believe, if that, of global spare capacity. I would say right here, right now, the number is even lower. The reason oil prices are lower today is obviously concerns about Iran potentially coming back. Interestingly, ties back to gas. Because gas prices are high, people are expecting a recession, which will then curtail oil demand. Right now, there's not a lot, lot of logic in the market. And the reason I say that is mm -hmm. because, for sure, a weak economic growth environment is weak, f uh, as in it's bearish for oil, but ultimately it will also be bearish for gas. But yeah. somehow it's a very one-sided story right now. And I think a lot of traders are actually betting on, and they are putting on positions, which is long gas, short crude. Amrita, you mentioned Iran and the question of whether or not a nuclear deal will actually be reached. A, what do you think the likelihood of that is? And B, even if one is reached, how long would it realistically take for those barrels to reach the market? Look, I'm not going to give, I'm not trying to be like or giving a cop out answer, but right now the chances of a deal are pretty much 50 50. We've been for a while saying that, look, chances of a deal are very low, more like 15, 20 percent. We do think the chances have risen. The movement has definitely come from the Iranian side. They have been struggling economically. Now, having said that, by no means is this a done deal. The way I would put it is that the Iranians have gone back to the EU draft. It's not a yes or a no. There's a lot of if statements in there. What we understand is nothing in there is as atrocious that the US and the Europeans will just throw it out straight away, saying <laughs> that this is ridiculous. But there are some pretty tricky demands to meet. So this can still not happen. Uh, we don't have Iran in our balances. If Iran does come back, and especially because they've got about 65 to 70 million barrels in floating storage, you will see pressure on prices, particularly towards the back half of the year. Like you're saying, when can they come back? It will still take a minimum of two to three months because you need to go through some congressional approvals before sanctions can be lifted. That's going to be December before Iranian oil hits the market. Amrita, thank you. Amrita Sen there of Energy Aspects. Nothing sleepy about the commodity market this year. A bit snoozy this morning, though. Unchanged on Brent essentially at 92.28. WTI positive almost a tenth of one percent let's call it 86 dollars and about 70 cents futures though we've got some price mm -hmm. action we're down seven tenths on the s p on the nasdaq 100 down about eight tenths of one percent you will notice yields are kicking higher on a u.s 10 year this morning right. seeing treasuries up six basis points there 286 58 tom though i have said it a few times this morning if you need a bigger move than that Look to the UK. That move at the front end of the UK is just a monster move yeah. off the back of a monster upside surprise you, on UK CPI. I don't know if you get an emergency meeting or not. I don't know enough about Bank of England. But, John, for the pros out there, there's an 11 ratio idea, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. And we need this morning, John, to consider, will that accommodative trend index 
move from zero to a positive, very constructive accommodation. It's been a stunning move away from fear, away from a restrictive structure over the last four or five weeks. Inflation in the UK, 10.1% wow. in July, up from 9.4%, and we were looking for a move to 9.8%. <clears throat> so there's your double-digit CPI yeah. in the UK. Futures right now, down seven tenths on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down eight tenths of 1%. In just a moment, we'll catch up with the brilliant Gargi Chowdhury of BlackRock. That conversation about four minutes away from New York, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. market's been enjoying the sunshine over the last few weeks and i don't think that's gonna last we're still reeling from the unevenness of you know, both the reopening the supply chain disruptions you know an economy is still kind of moving beyond the pandemic i think the market probably does not move materially higher from here i think 4300 will likely continue to be a resistance we think it's probably going to be growth that surprises us on the downside we are going to come out of this COVID crisis with a k-shaped recovery this is bloomberg surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. I can confirm that TK is considering a Manchester United bid. I heard it a little bit earlier <laughs> no, this tots. morning. Touch, Tom. Tots. Okay, we'll talk about numbers in just a moment. From tots. New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, with Tom Keen, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with the brilliant Kelly Lyons. Bramo coming back on Monday. Futures negative six tenths of 1% on the SP. TK, next big stop for this market rally. Retail sales 90 minutes away. You see it in the opening comments there, and we've seen it with our head spinning on John's one day hauls that extended into a week long. Over, let's say, the last 10 days. John, I've never seen strategists with their heads spinning, and it comes right back down to what we heard from Target 20 minutes ago. Guess what? It's all about the hope and prayer of a rebound. That's what every strategist is looking at. Well, Tom, strategists are still pushing back. Mark Hayfley of yes. UBS this morning said, we'd caution investors <clears throat> against chasing this rally. Yesterday, City said, perhaps you should tactically sell into further strength, and perhaps that's justified. Their words, Tom, not mine. That's the wall of doubt in the face of a rally that's now 17.5% well, <clears throat> off the lows of June. We haven't brought this up yet, John, but yesterday a lot of people picking up on a Bank of America note which said enough, where they've been, you know, okay, up, up we go, we get a rebound, bear market rebound, and then it really, Michael Hartnett really paused the market yesterday. You love that, Tom. I watched everyone try to say we're no longer apocalyptically Apocalyptically. <laughs> but still it's too bearish to expect it. an immediate turnaround in the bear market rally. Katie Lines, did you get all that? Apocalyptically. It takes yeah. no longer some apocalyptically effort. bearish. Yeah, so the idea is that sentiment has improved, basically all predicated on this hope that we're going to get a dovish pivot from the Federal Reserve, that we've seen both peak inflation dovish and pivot. peak central bank hawkishness, which is going to make the data this morning very important and a lot more important for the Fed minutes yeah. coming at 2 p.m. Eastern time as well. What was great, John? Dovish Pivot was a bar band down at UVA. They played Dave Matthews <laughs> like nobody. Is that the name of the bar? Yeah. Or no, the band? Th the band was Dovish Pivot. Okay. They were really yeah. good. Hawkish turn. Sensitive. Is that a good they were band? Sensitive. Were they opening for Dutch pivot? Okay. All right. Enough of that. Futures are down by six or seven tenths of one percent on the S and P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down about three quarters of one percent. Kaylee's going to guide you through the day ahead in just a moment. Just want to guide you through the bond market too. Big moves in the UK. Big moves in Treasuries. Up six basis points on tens to 286.76. Double digit CPI in the UK. Kaylee Lyons. That's the appetite for the data still ahead of us. Yep. 10.1 percent inflation. Absolutely brutal for the UK consumer and for the Bank of England with traders now pricing in 200 basis points of hikes by May. Definitely something we're going to need to watch. But there's also a lot to watch in the day ahead. 8.30 a.m. Eastern is the big economic report here in the U.S. As we've been talking about retail sales, we're expecting growth of just a tenth of a percent month on month on the headline. X auto and gas, though, up four tenths of one percent. How much will this report reflect an American consumer that is faced with lower prices at the pump and as a result is able to shift some of their spending into other more discretionary areas. That's definitely something to keep an eye on. <clears throat> then at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, we're going to get U.S. crude oil inventories. We're expecting a drawdown on crude inventories and an even bigger drawdown on gasoline it's inventories. A it's a less, uh, yeah, with crude down 29% uh, so far since the peak in June, Tom. We have seen prices come dramatically lower. The, the idea was that this is demand destruction, right? Prices got too high, so people weren't 
going to the pump as much. But if we're seeing a drawdown in inventories, does that send a more positive signal about a recovery in demand? Then finally, 2 p.m. Eastern time, Fed minutes from the July minute meeting will be crossing. We know they hiked 75 basis points. What we'll look for inside on is to their thinking around whether they're going to have to do that again. Right now, the market pricing essentially even odds of another 75 basis point a hike come September. But of course, as we've seen this narrative building on a more dovish Federal Reserve, how much does the language in those minutes maybe push back on that idea, John? Kaylee, tearing us up for Jackson Hole, Wyoming next week. TK, I think Jackson Hole's huge. I really do. The road to the <laughs> September meeting is so, so long. We've got financial conditions easing aggressively into that meeting where a lot of people still expect them to hike somewhere between yeah. 50 basis points and 75. Jackson Hole is always an unknown, but definitely, John, I tilt to the idea this will be a speech of substance just because of the midterm elections. He's got to get, at, he's got to get out front quicker than usual this year because of those important elections. Since the middle of June, equities are up by 17.4% on the S&P 500. Credit spreads <clears throat> are much, much tighter. Gargi Chowdhury joins us now, the head of America's iShares investment strategy at BlackRock. Gargi, do you and the team trust this rally? Good morning. It's great to be here, John, uh, Tom, and Kaylee. Um, so trust this rally. Well, it's definitely been a surprising one. We have been telling investors that they should remain invested, <clears throat> but really pick where in the markets they should be invested in. And we've been talking about looking at minimum volatility as an area of the market. We've been talking about healthcare, healthcare providers. Certainly don't expect this rally to continue to have the same type of legs that we've seen, the 17% jump that you noted from the middle of June that feels like it's maybe coming close to an end. But at the same time, I don't think that we're going to go back to the <clears> lows that we saw earlier this year, because much of the bad news that the market had to grapple with in the beginning of the year has already happened. We've seen that massive right. 300 basis point uh, pricing of the Fed. What's the level of pressure right now? We're getting right to the point where the year end battle and particularly conservative institutional money is there. Year to date, Standard & Poor's 500 negative negative 10 percent. If I'm underperforming that, how do I recover to year end? I think that there are a couple of areas of the market that certainly have brought about some opportunities. And we were talking, we were listening to Amrita <coughs> earlier talking about oil. I think not looking at commodities per se, but energy companies, which obviously are going to have a very good earnings period ahead because of their cash flows. I think that can and continues to provide a pretty interesting area of the market to invest in. Similarly, clean energy, I would say, is another area, especially given uh, the recent bill that was passed. Um, I also think fixed income. And Jonathan, I know we talked about this earlier last week in your show, but... Oh, you did on his other property. <laughs> we talked about the amazing oh, yields Pharaoh of dreams. <laughs> it's real yield, Tom. That's where Gargi wished she was Thank today. You. But unfortunately, it's only on Fridays at 1pm and it's weekly. Carry Thank on, Gargi, please. But we talked please. about yield of dreams. And I think fixed income is really attractive once again at some of these levels. You're looking <clears> for that extra credit in your portfolio and looking at investment-grade credit is especially the shorter end of investment grade credit, uh, makes a lot of sense here. So there are some ways in which investors can, um, you know, look to make a few uh, basis points or a few percentage points back between now and the end of the year. Okay, and maybe some places where you can still play defense as well. And yet, Gargi, what we've seen in recent weeks is a revival of some of those speculative areas of the equity market. I'm mm -hmm. looking at Bed Bath & Beyond up another 22% this morning after rallying 350% in the last three <clears throat> weeks. Gross stocks are leading once again. It seems like it's a return to 2021 almost. Most. What kind of signal do you take from that activity? I think that the signal that that gives me is that real rates got to an area where perhaps the market thought that it's going to pause for a little bit. I think we were used to a period of rising real rates in the beginning of this year, and then they've paused. Um, I certainly don't think that this is the point at which you're supposed to go all into growth stocks. I think there will be a time. It's not yet, because obviously we're still going to hear from the Fed, especially today, and obviously in Jackson Hole as well. And I think they're going to still guide 
us towards uh, somewhat higher rates. So I don't think this is the moment yet to get back to growth stocks. I think some of this rally has probably been a combination of real rate stabilizing and also short covering, I would say. Um, so I think there's going to be a point perhaps later this year, perhaps going into next year, where you're really going to have that opportunity to get back into growth stocks where we are going to get that pivot. It didn't come in the July meeting, even though the market certainly behaved as if it had. But I think there's going to be a time for the Fed pivot to happen, and it's not till perhaps later this year or earlier in 2023. In the meantime, what should we do with inflation protection? Gargi, having followed your work closely this year, I think one defining position you still have is that you're not willing to fake the inflation story just yet. You still think mm -hmm. investors should protect themselves. Can you walk us through the why and the where? Sure. So what we've been seeing in the inflation data recently is this persistent strength, this stickiness in services inflation, especially in shelter inflation. And as we know, shelter inflation is about 40 percent of core inflation, and that's moving higher. On the other hand, what we're seeing is goods inflation actually coming down, and that's probably going to continue to do so. So looking ahead, I think the story is going to be around shelter inflation remaining higher and actually allowing for, unfortunately, core inflation to remain at least around this 5% level going into year end of 2022, perhaps coming down to maybe 3% or so next year, but that's still a very long time away. So where we think investors, especially fixed income investors that are looking to protect themselves against higher inflation, where they can play this is with shorter dated inflation linked bonds. So not the entirety of the inflation linked bond market, because of course that has a lot of duration, but also can often uh, not do as well when uh, growth slows down. But the front end is where you're going to get that carry. Front end is where you're going to get paid to own those bonds when inflation comes in higher uh, between now and the next few years. Gaki, this was awesome and great to see you in person here in New York City. Gaki Chowdhury there of BlackRock. <laughs> Tom, I think what Gaki's doing there is talking about the next phase of this trade. What are we trading on right now? Peak year over year inflation, a mechanical peak as well, because it's all about base effects. So you get this peak year over year inflation. People get comfortable with that idea. They start repricing the terminal rate. Tom, the next phase of the discussion is the one that you've been having for months. It's the what next? OK, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Where do you settle? That, and if you settle down at four, how much work does the Fed have to do? And do you have to reprice the terminal rate all over again? I haven't seen the papers yet for Jackson Hole, nor has anyone else. The Kansas City Fed, to their great credit, keep that very quiet up to next week, Thursday ish. But, John, I think any paper we see on inflation trend dynamics is absolutely critical. Kalanovic at J.P. Morgan says we see a rapid move down inflation and others say not so much. Looking forward to the coverage in Jackson Hole, Wyoming next week with the surveillance team and Mike McKee alongside us, making that even better. Yields up six basis points on a 10-year, 286.94. Equities down seven tenths on the S&P 500. In the next hour, the brilliant Alicia Levine of BMY Mellon. Looking forward to that conversation. And in just a moment, AMH down in D.C. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerens. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has warned civilians to stay away from military facilities occupied by Russian forces. That followed explosions at a Russian ammo dump in Crimea. An advisor to Zelensky has said the blast marked the beginning of a series of attacks. Last week, explosions at a Russian airbase in Crimea destroyed fighter jets. Now, here in the UK, inflation jumped more than expected last month. To the highest level in 40 years. The consumer price index rose 10.1% in July from a year ago, following a 9.4% gain in June. That will put pressure on the British government and on the Bank of England to take action. Germany will struggle to have enough natural gas to get through the winter. That is according to the country's energy regulator, which says Germany will have enough gas for less than three months if Russia cuts off supplies completely. The country is racing to fill its winter stockpiles after Russia drastically reduce flows on the key Nord Stream pipeline. Target posted second quarter profit that badly missed estimates. Still, the discount retailer is sticking with its forecast of a dramatic rebound in the second half of its fiscal year. The profit plunge reflects decisions Target outlined in June to slash prices on home appliances, patio furniture and other discretionary items. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts and more than 120. 
20 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. since January 6th that I will do whatever it takes to ensure Donald Trump is never again anywhere near the Oval Office. And I mean it. Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney there of Wyoming after losing her primary to someone else. And we're going to talk about that someone else, Ms. Hageman, in just a moment. From New York City this morning, good morning. Tom Keane, Kelly Lyons and Jonathan Farrow. Futures down 8 or 9 tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down around about 1 full percentage point now. We roll over. Yields are higher by 7 basis points, 287.12 on a 10-year. And just a bit of news on Congresswoman Cheney, Tom, speaking Sorry. on the Today Show on NBC, saying she's thinking about running for president, will make a decision in the coming months. Probably Elon Musk is as well. John, can we pause here for a moment? Amory can can pause and sure. you know, consider the view in Washington. That is 811 days from the 2024 election. Can we just state that the British do this better I than I know we you do? like saying that periodically, don't you, Tom? There is a long, 811 long runway. It's the days. primaries, TK. You take so long to select a candidate for each party. That is a good place to start with Henry sure. Horton, who's expert on this. And of course, we'll enjoy 2022, 23, and most of 24 as well. And Maria, it is all about the primaries. Does the Cheney party, and I mean Vice President Cheney's party, are they even part of the GOP primary? Not really. I mean, it's a great question. There are a number of candidates that Trump backed that did lose, but overwhelmingly his his candidates won. And this is the stat we have in our morning brief. Of the 270 candidates for international, federal, state, local, and political positions Trump has endorsed since leaving office, 216 have won. A number ran an unopposed, but only 17 have lost. He is clearly, even though he's not in office, <laughs> Even though he didn't win the 2020 election, right. he is clearly still the head of this party. And you see a number of candidates show fealty to him to want to make sure they could win. But in her concession speech, Liz Cheney said she could have done that to secure her political right. future in Wyoming, but she refused to. Do the Democrats want President Trump to run, though? Well, that's a great question because a lot of Democrats would think that if you just have a rematch of 2020, Biden would still win. Well, and the president has indicated as well that he does intend to run again in 2024. But as Tom alluded to, there is a lot of runway until we get to the presidential elections of 2024. What about the midterm elections of 2022? Can, can we really just talk about whether or not the fate of the Democratic Party has changed at all, given the small wins mm. President Biden has been notching over the last several weeks, including the signing of the Inflation Reduction Act yesterday? It's a great question. You know, Jonathan had been talking about this for months, actually saying he thought the timeline was potentially on people's sides in terms of inflation coming down. And they had a little bit of wiggle room, and they did have a very productive summer. There was a bipartisan gun legislation. They were able to secure the backing of Congress for Finland and Sweden to join NATO. And then, of course, you have their agenda they've been wanting to get through in terms of climate provisions, Medicare provisions, uh, raising of some taxes. Although, as Jonathan pointed out in the last hour, they're not exactly clo closing special interest loopholes. But this is something they could go home to their constituents and say, look at all the stuff we actually were able to get done. We were able to get that done because we have these slim majorities. Vote us back in. There's a long list of provisions we continue want to get done. Imagine a lot of people are going to say, put me back in office. I will work for family leave. And a number of other things that were originally on the close to $10 trillion Build Back Better. Uh, and also the other big thing that I think we were talking about every single day was gas prices. It has evaporated from the news because now what you have are gas prices that are pretty average for the everyday American consumer, under $4 a gallon. If that continues, this is certainly going to help the Democrats. Down every single day since the middle of June. Quite remarkable. Yeah. We're talking about primaries here, AMH, and we could spend a long time talking about Republican primaries coming up on the horizon next year and beyond. Are we going to have primaries for the Democrats? I think that's the big question coming out of the midterms, whether the president can actually put to bed this idea that he's going to run 
in the second time for the second time for a second term because when he says it and when people talk about it there's so many people that don't believe him so two things one the president could not come out and say i'm not running right then he would be a lame duck potentially he could closer to 2024 <clears throat> but what we are hearing in the reporting is that he plans to run even though you do have members of his party saying thank you for beating the former president trump now it's time to pass this on to a new generation. Following the midterms, this is going to be the most important discussion, I imagine, within the Democratic Party. AMH, just briefly, anyone in Washington want to buy Manchester United? <laughs> Any talk? I, the Cheney's I'd love thinking to buy, about it. I'd, lo I'd love to buy a, a football team in the United Kingdom. No, so far, there is not a say. I haven't heard anyone in Washington looking to buy a sports team. There we go. AMH, <laughs> thank you. At least not European football. <laughs> Elon Musk with a joke ad on Twitter, if just you're just tuning in. It's just a joke. I'm buying <laughs> Manchester United, you're welcome. <laughs> he then said it was just a joke. It's on, we've put out an opinion column on Bloomberg. It's, it's the tweet. Manchester United fans are so fed up with their current owners that even a joke bid from Elon Musk sounds like an improvement. How'd you like that, Tom? To think yeah, that well, the stock's up. The stock is up in the pre-market by 4.5% yeah, on the back us. of this. John, help us here, because most of us, you know, I like sure. to play knowledgeable. I'm dumb as wood on this. John, just as simple as it can, it, it's the second week of the season. Don't these teams turn it around? They can turn it around, Tom, if you've made the right transfers in the summer transfer window. And I think the problem is that people <clears> don't think they've made the right transfers in that window. They've still got a few weeks left, which means you might get a panic buy. And for that reason, TK, given their performance over the last couple of weeks, a lot of people yeah. don't think they can turn it around. <clears throat> it looks like mid-table okay. mediocrity based on what we've seen so far. Anybody and if they're lucky. Yeah. Anybody know an update on Musk and Twitter? Kaylee, are you up to speed on this? John and I aren't. I think there's the debate about whether or not he's going to get content from all the Twitter employees he wants to. We'll look for what the outcome of the trial is in October. It's a saga that is ongoing, but it really just speaks to Elon Musk saying he's going to do things that he wants to do things and then backing out and manipulating markets along the way. John, you asked if anyone in Washington is looking to buy the team. I'm just wondering if anyone in Washington's looking at these tweets and saying, we need to do something to regulate this it's guy. It's a publicly listed company and we're just right. sort of joking about buying it and of course if I joke about buying it no one believes it and the stock doesn't move because I haven't got the money to buy it but Tom he's potentially got the money to buy something like that and that's why some people oh yeah take it yeah. seriously no no absolutely 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 and if he made you know is oh I, I'm gonna be getting myself go in on trouble do it here. go there. no no please okay <laughs> if, if, if he did a Twitter to be diplomatic about it maybe the family would say it's the Glazer family, right, John? It's the Glazer family. I, I get the teams mixed They up. own the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Is that right, Tom? I, I Yeah, they own the, the Bradys. Mm. The Bradys. The Bradys. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Futures down. Eight-tenths of one percent on the S&P. In just a moment, we'll catch up it's with Mike Collins of PGM. In about an hour and five minutes, we'll American get retail Joe sales in America. From New York, John this is Bloomberg. Joe. What? We keep squeezing out a day of gains on the S&P 500. We've had three of them. This morning, we're starting the day like we started yesterday and the day before. Negative on the S&P 500, negative on the Nasdaq. We're down about eight tenths on the S&P. Rolling over again on the Nasdaq 100, down about one full percentage point, but quite a rally off the lows. We keep talking about it. Close to 17.5% off the lows on the S&P 500. Those June lows. And every single time we get a little bit of a burst of a rally, a little bit more, we get more pushback. Just a wall of doubt. You're hearing it from UBS this morning, the message from them is that maybe you shouldn't chase this rally. The message from City <laughs> overnight, they're saying perhaps selling into strength might be justified. TK, how many times have we heard yeah. this? And this market keeps well, hopping over that wall of doubt. We heard it on Jobs Day. We heard it on the CPI Day. And today is Retail Wednesday. Retail Sales, Tom. Retail Sales Wednesday. Yeah. I didn't get that in, did I? That's coming in about an hour. You you Look failed. for that data point, you know, Tom. I'll do that, in, the, I'll do that in every single tease through the rest of this show. All right, retail sales Wednesday coming up. Very so equities negative, will these losses stick? Let's have a look. We're at the lows of the session, I think, at about negative 1% on the NASDAQ. And what we're seeing in the bond market is interesting. So what I want to do is look at the Treasury curve and then get global. Let's start with a two-year in the U.S., up nine basis points on a two-year to 334.55. Just starting to get back towards that high for 2022 on a two-year yield. On a 10-year Treasury, up nine basis points as well to about 289. I wanted to start with the U.S. and then get global, so let's get global. Let's 
let's just go over the Atlantic and go to the UK and go to Germany. Look at gilts and look at buns. This move in the UK off the back of double digit CPI through 10%, we've got yields up on a two year, not on the week, not on the month, not on the year, on the session, Tom, by 26 basis points. That's a big move <coughs> for a big bond market. Well, and again, I'm going to go to the persistency of higher inflation, John. We're talking about levels here, 9 point this, 10 point that, and whatever. But as you stay, to sustain up, there's got to be an increasing doubt that you can come down. To me, that's what's changed today. What day is it, Tom? Retail sales Wednesday. It's retail sales there you go. Wednesday. Yields up in Germany as well on the two year there, up about 16 or 17 basis points. That's a cross asset price action. <clears throat> Going into retail sales, we've got to talk about some retailers. Let's do that. Retail, 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 retail. It's what it's all about today, John. Of course, you had Target reporting just about an hour ago. What was interesting is they have lowered the bar twice going into this report, and they still missed it by a huge margin. Earnings of just 39 cents per share. The estimate was 72 cents. You had the stock dropping like a rock initially on that, but the company saying that they've already worked through most of their inventory issues has it off the lows, though it's still down about 3.7% on that miss. For lows, they're higher by about 1.6%. You had a beat on earnings and on operating margin, which is where that optimism is coming from. And interestingly for TJX, they also raised their margin outlook for the fiscal year 2023 pre-tax. Yet the fact that comp sales were lower and revenue was a little light is taking the stock down a little more than 1%. Let's also talk about retail traders, or at least meme traders because these stocks have made a ridiculous comeback in recent weeks. Bed Bath & Beyond is the new poster child. It's up 350% in the last three weeks alone and it's higher. Oh, that's Best Buy. So that would be why that is. It's down 2%. Bed Bath & Beyond is up more like 20% nice uh, right now before there, the Kelly. bell. Thank you very much, Tom. And GameStop, of course, was They're the initial Dow meme components. stock. is up 1.2 percent. Always got to work the Dow in there. Finally, just ending on Manchester United. This is a story we've talked about this morning. Elon Musk was just kidding. He's not buying the football team. I said soccer earlier and got a little bit of punishment for it. But look, the stock is still up 7.4 percent, even though he said it was a joke. And that is actually off the pre-market session highs. Right when pre-market trading opened at 4 a.m. Eastern, Unreal. Tom, that stock was up 17 percent. Talk about a man capable of moving a market. I can clarify Bloomberg style, and you can share this with Matt Miller a little bit later, <laughs> Kelly Lines. According to our editor-in-chief, and this changed a number of months ago, Tom, it is football when you are talking about European football, world football. It is soccer if you are talking about the game being played here in the United States. So if you were talking right. about the MLS, you could refer to the sport as soccer. And if you're talking about anything else, you could talk about football. So we're talking about football now, Tom, and this Manchester is, United. Is that, is that helpful? Debate. Just in case, Tom, you were considering yeah. writing a story about it <clears throat> yeah, and what's happening this morning and perhaps yeah. declaring your interest in another football club oh, yeah, the over tots, in the UK. The Tots play soccer and the Spurs play football. That's all there is. Is that right? Uh, to okay. it. Michael Collins with us now. This is an important conversation. Senior portfolio manager at PGM and steeped in the mathematics of Binghamton and other good universities as well. Michael, love talking to you about the dynamics of the moment. There's a major core debate on the glide path of disinflation. How does that fold into owning and husbanding yield right now? Yeah, well, Tom, one thing we're seeing is this big tug of war between growth and inflation, right? And growth globally uh, actually seems to be holding up pretty well. Uh, we've seen European GDP continue to be actually a little bit stronger than expected. And in the U.S., you know, we saw it in the labor market. We'll get retail sales uh, in an hour, and real retail sales will probably continue to be really weak or slightly negative. But obviously, nominal retail sales are really strong. Uh, and, and inflation, right? Inflation, as you've all pointed out, uh, especially in places like Europe and the UK, uh, and to some extent, the US are really sticky. Uh, but that disinflationary trend is beginning to reemerge. We are seeing goods inflation. We are seeing leading indicators of goods inflation pointing towards zero goods inflation. And I would bet in the next 6, 12 months, you see zero uh, goods inflation uh, globally in the U.S. Yeah. And I think that's a big deal. Obviously, services inflation right. is sticky, but I think that will give the Fed some uh, optimism right. to, to slow down the pace of hikes. And John, this is like Michael Collins is writing the speech for Jerome Powell, the separation here of services and goods. Yeah. How many people, John, are expecting a massive disinflation of goods? I'd say it's a lonely crowd. So how much more work does this Fed need to do? With that in mind, I think this is so important. Mike, you've been in the camp that we've seen the higher the year on a 10-year yield. 
I wonder if that same theory applies to the two-year. Something's happening quietly here with the two-year yield. It peaked back in the middle of June, two days before the equity market bottomed at 345. Then it faded away and equities were off to the races and we rallied really hard as we faded that real yield as well. We've seen that two-year yield, the nominal yield, just pick up. Pick up a fair bit as well, Mike. I just wonder what you think about that back at 334 on a two-year in America. Yeah, and the way us bond geeks look at it, as, as you know, Jonathan and Tom and Kaylee, the, we look at those forward rates and, and what's priced into the market. And right now, with this jump in, in the front end of the curve, the markets are pricing in, obviously, a higher terminal funds rate of getting close to three and three quarters. So the question is, is the Fed actually going to be able to engineer another you know, 125, 150 basis points of rate hikes from here. And, and that is not clear. I mean, I, I don't have a lot of conviction either way on that. I mean, even if goods inflation goes to zero and services inflation is at five, that's still a three and a half percent, you know, core PCE or core CPI. I don't know if the Fed stops hiking at three and a half percent unless uh, growth is probably below two. So I think it's this balancing act between growth and inflation. I like to think about it in nominal GDP terms. You know, if you add those two up, if those two added up are below four, let's say, maybe that's enough for the Fed to, to pause. But if they remain above four, I think the Fed probably keeps going. Well, John was talking about the work being done at the short end and where that leaves the two year yield is about 45 basis points above that of the 10 year yield. How much further can this inversion go? What will the depths ultimately be? And how does your assumption of what the height of the Fed funds rate factor into that? Yeah, you know, that that curve inversion has, has been, you know, not totally unsurprising in a world where inflation is sticky, central banks all over the world are raising rates, and, and growth is moderating and slowing. Uh, you do see these flat and in, inverted curves. The question is, how deep can that inversion go? It's, you know, negative 40 ish call it twos, tens. Can it go to negative 80 or negative 100? Sure. I mean, if the funds mm -hmm. rate ends up at four this cycle, negative uh, that 100, curve will probably. Ryan Weinstein and Morgan Stanley said the same thing last week, too. Brilliant. John was sure. aware. Sure. I mean, I mean, we're actually uh, thinking over the next, you know, we're long term thinkers, as you all know, and long term investors over the next three years, what is the curve going to look like? And I think it's going to be back to the old, you know, bull steepener where the Fed by that point, we'll be cutting rates and you'll have this big bull steepener. But in the meantime, you know, it's really unclear which direction that that curve shape is going. We're pretty flat right now in terms of the curve positioning because of the uncertainty. But but yeah, I mean, if the Fed keeps going, the curve continues to invert. So, Mike, given that, what business do high yield spreads have being down at 400 basis points? Yeah, we're we are in in the camp, you know that that you're supposed to really uh, take some chips off the table here. I mean, yeah, credit quality has been sound. Uh, we've just started to see the first sign of some downgrades uh, in the high yield market in some very specific sectors like cruise lines and and healthcare. But by and large, the upgrades continue to outnumber downgrades. Credit quality is good. These companies are flush with cash. They've done a great job managing liquidity, managing the bottom lines, but valuations i don't think right now and maybe you could apply this to the stock market as well the investment grade corporate market may not be fully compensating investors for these for these big kind of tail risks that are still out there right i mean we could have a a deepening recession globally that that is certainly uh in the cards as well mike collins just awesome to get you on the show let's catch up again soon mike collins there of pgm on the latest in this bond market and tk within that some big calls potentially down to negative 100 on the yield curve, and that's that's a move. That's some real inversion. Well, that, yeah, that's and then pushing huge. back against the high yield spread tightness we've seen, the compression over the last couple of months. Well, that's truly Volcker-like. And to go the other way, we've gone to remind everyone from negative 49 basis points out to negative 39, and we've come halfway back in two cups of coffee to negative 45 basis points in the two cent spread. I think it's like everything else, John. There's the the disparity of opinions we're living here on Bloomberg surveillance is. Extraordinary. Do you think that the yield move this morning, Tom, is connected to the weakness we're seeing in the equity market? The Nasdaq down about 1%? We were negative morning, 26 before the target earnings, and now we're negative 36. I think there's more going on maybe in the last 10 minutes. 
you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure. It's a big move. Eight basis points on twos, on tens, <clears throat> eight basis points, and Kaylee a whole lot bigger over in the UK and Germany. Yeah, double that and more. The two-year yield up 25 basis points on the back of 10.1% inflation. Talk about brutal, John. Well, we've seen a bit of this through the week so far. Some weakness in the morning, and then we've bought that weakness and closed out with a day of gains. We'll see if we can repeat that act a little bit later. From New York, we'll catch up with Mike Dada at 8.30 Eastern time. We'll do that just after the retail sales number but drops in America. Tom, it is Retail Sales Wednesday. This is Bloomberg. Nice, nice promotion. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerrans. The new head of OPEC warns that global oil markets face a high risk of a supply squeeze this year. Haytham Algai sat down with Bloomberg TV in his first interview since taking office at the start of August. I think we are running on thin ice if I may use that term, because spare capacity is becoming scarce. And this is an issue. It's like an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. We don't want the oil markets to run on without insurance policy. Al Gais says that global demand will increase by almost 3 million barrels a day this year, boosted by China's return from lockdowns. Now, Goldman Sachs says that a deal to revive the nuclear agreement between Iran, the EU and the US is unlikely to be reached in the near term. The firm predicted that even if there is a breakthrough, additional oil from Iran won't start to flow until next year. The US is looking at Iran's response to a draft proposal of an agreement. China is warning the US not to sail war ships through the Taiwan Strait. The Chinese ambassador to the U.S. said Beijing's views such actions as an escalation by America. The Biden administration has said it would send warships and fighter jets through the strait. Now, that is after China responded to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan with a series of military exercises. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 100 and 20 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. The U.S. economy right now is in a stronger and a more resilient place than any other major economy globally to actually navigate the global challenges that we face, which include potential growth slowdown in China, which also include the impact of the war in Ukraine. I throw in the potential of a recession in Europe too. That was Brian Deese, the director of the National Economic Council, and you'd have to say this White House has a <clears> relatively <throat> better story to tell over the last couple of weeks. With Tom Keane and Kelly Lyons, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures are down by eight or nine tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Nasdaq 100 futures down <clears> by let's call it one full percentage point. And here's the move in the bond market: yields higher by eight basis points on a 10-year in the U.S. 288. I'd go to the U.K. where you're seeing an explosive move higher in UK gilt yields, Tom, and I don't think I'm overdoing it using that language, up 23 basis points on a two-year, on a 10-year up 16 basis points on double-digit CPI the in the United yeah, Kingdom. The focus on explosive and the y-axis, up, up we go on inflation, and I would take it out again to the x-axis, John, and the persistency that we could see in continental and United Kingdom inflation. To give us perspective, Always, Marcus Asherth, who joins me each ECB uh, day with Bloomberg Intelligence. Marcus, wonderful uh, to have you with us this morning. How does the x-axis change when you go double digit? Do you, in the theory that you read, believe a more persistent inflation because it is so high? Yes, I think you have to. I think you have to expect wage uh, negotiations to be harder uh, because people see double digit inflation. It's going to change psychology from people putting up restaurant prices to <clears throat> corporates, the whole the whole schmear. It's going to be uh, much harder for the Bank of England to um, react in the sense that they've lost right. the plot. Uh, everyone can see they have. <clears throat> they're going to have to hike 50 basis points, not 25, at the September 10th meeting. Um, the question is whether or not they hike more than they otherwise would, and that is less clear. I think we may get earlier, bigger rate hike now, but it still doesn't mean that the final peak rate or neutral rate will be that much different because 
we're going to get a recession here at this rate. You know, 30 percent right. inflation in October. Marcus, the dynamics of the sterling cuts two ways, higher interest rates, up, up, stronger sterling, resilient sterling, and the other is the economic slowdown that you mentioned. Can sterling revisit John Major weakness off of this inflation? Yes, it can. I mean, I don't think this makes much move for sterling either way. You can see, you know, cable hasn't really budged. Um, so and a hike of 50 rather than 25 weirdly doesn't seem to affect the currency that much. This is all about the stunning money markets. The front end of the UK curve has been obliterated this morning. Everyone is badly positioned, lulled into a summer sense of, uh, of contentment because the US number was, was, was a surprise drop and we got a surprise bigger rise. That's really double bad news. A lot of people poorly positioned. You look at some like forward one year uh, uh, money market futures, they dropped by 100 basis points in price, as in 100 basis points up in yield in effect uh, over the last two or three weeks. Everyone's got this position badly wrong and got too uh, complacent and they've been woken up sharply. And Marcus, when you look at the breakdown, the composition of this move higher in UK inflation, food, energy, travel, what can the Bank of England actually do about this? Well, I know, as I said, the, the, ten, the, the double digit number is going to cause them a lot of problems with the, the stickier supply side, uh, sort of, pardon me, the services sector, which is clearly coming through. That will worry them. The wage data yesterday was actually probably even more worrying for them because it shows that you know, wage rises are actually pretty good. They're, they're, they're doing really well. It's just a take away inflation and we're, 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 we're in a negative uh, situation as far as real incomes are concerned. But nonetheless, the actual drive of the economy in labor and in wages is strong. We know that the, the balance sheets of, of corporates and households and banks are strong. It's That's the fact that inflation is going to be a continuing problem for them. Petrol prices, gassing will drop. So the next two months, we'll probably see a fall back in the headline rate. But we know in October, there is going to be a big energy price cap lift. It's going to push it up to 13% or possibly more. It sounds like listening to you, Marcus, that you think we get a two-punch combo here. The first one is this relief that you start to believe that we've had peak year-over-year -year inflation and that wasn't too bad, let's move on. Then we all relaxed and get punched in the face later this year. Do you think that's the same is true in the US? Tom's been talking about how sticky US inflation might be. Might come down <coughs> to five or six and then ultimately what next And this Fed is going to have a tough decision to make. Is that where you're at? No, I think the UK's got a special situation. I don't think you can read it across from the... Uh... Uh, US, I, I don't think that's necessarily quite as simple for the states. We, we've got a really odd situation. We'll be fiscally tightening, which is the only country crazy enough to do that. But with regards to our price cap, we've decided to sh let the market run riot rather than uh, keep a price lid on it like we have in Europe and subsidize people's incomes. Long term, that's probably the right thing to do. Short term, it's a very yeah. painful political thing and it affects our inflation data. So Ignore us, I think, is the best thing. But, Marcus, to that point, we've seen la Labor say, we want to freeze the price cap, hold it where it is. You have Rishi Sunak pushing bad on that, back on that idea, Liz Truss, warning against throwing money at a short-term solution. What is the appropriate fiscal response, not just monetary? Well, we're stuck with a system which was created by the previous government um, you know, quite a few years ago. And, look, it's trying to fix something midway through a crisis never works. We've got to stick with this. Uh, we've got to subsidize uh, lower incomes, which they're doing. The price cap is a system which is, you know, no system is great here. And, and I don't think what's going on in Europe is necessarily very healthy with having to bail out uh, energy, uh, the EDF, the <coughs> French supplier, likewise in Germany. You know, this is, we're showing what the problems are. We're going to have to subsidize people with income. It's not a great way of going about things, but it's the way we've got, and we've got to have to stick with it, unfortunately. Marcus, just quickly before you run, you're really on top of this story in a way that I'm not. Do we need to pay a little bit more attention to the prospect of the mandate of the Bank of England changing with a new government? How serious is this? It's a red herring. I would ignore it. You know, the, the only way this ever works is if it's done with the agreement of the Bank of England. Bailey's admitted that, that he has to be open-minded. Look, with a 2% target and inflation five times that and going to more than six or seven times that, if he said anything else, he, he really shouldn't be in the job. Yes, there is a chance and should be looking at what has gone wrong. That's sensible in any, any organization. The Bank of England isn't immune from that. Whether they change it or not, as long as everyone's in agreement, that means the Bank of England, as well as the Treasury and the government, then it, it shouldn't be an issue. Marcus, thank you.
as always, Marcus Ashworth there. Brilliant. He's a rugby fan, Tom. He can't talk about the Manchester United news oh, like or Johnson. lack thereof. Guy Johnson. Guy Johnson's a rugby boy throws, too. Throws a drink at me. Different, different education, Tom. What, what's different the schools. percentage difference between soccer and rugby in the United Kingdom? Is it, is it like 10 to 1? Tom. Did he call it soccer again? He did. Is oh, it like 10 to 1 or 5 to 1? I don't know what the ratio is, Tom. But usually if you go to a posh school, you play rugby. And if you go to a state school, you play football. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's the thing, Tom. I didn't know that. Which is why we have that sort of famous phrase. Right. Have you ever heard a gentleman's game yeah. played by hooligans and yeah. a hooligan's game played by yeah. gentlemen? You Kaylee, heard that one before? Kaylee, this just in. We need your advice here, Kaylee. Hope you're coming with us as, as well. We've got a good, good amount of people coming to Jackson Hole as well. John Farrell, outfitted here. We're looking to Lucchese not only for the great boots that they make. Got a pair. My old boots tucked away at home in the closet. But I look at... You know, John Farrell, and you look at John Wayne as well. Now, it's not a John Wayne look, but Wayne wore the Resistol felt hat of Garland. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the price. Yeah. And, and, $495 well, the for George, a hat. The George Strait hat is $40 cheaper, but, John, I just think this says you yeah, in that, a more that's urbane a no, that's kind a no of me. way. Do you, know, do, do you know what the kids are wearing now? Do you know what Anne-Marie's been wearing, Tom? A Prada bucket hat. Oh, it's, yeah, it's that's about very bucket hats this yes. summer, apparently. Yeah. Just apparently buy the knockoffs on Amazon. John, Five, 500 advice. bucks John, for a hat. There's a Prada bucket TK, hat no. in the house. No, 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 no. As inflation is easing, it's giving the Fed more wiggle room. I think the key theme on the inflation front is going to be that divergence between headline inflation and core inflation. Even though inflation may have peaked, I think the market is discounting that the Fed sticks the landing. If we do head into a recession, the Fed and central banks around the world are going to cut rates more than is currently priced in. I think the probabilities have increased for soft landing. I don't think it's still the base case. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abraham. Good morning, everyone. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Jonathan Fair, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen. Lisa is off, off, off. She's on a one-day hauls. We'll see how long that goes, like Farrell's hauls of last week. Uh, Kaylee lines in uh, today as well. It's not double-digit inflation in Spain or America. John, double-digit inflation in your United Kingdom. I was shocked. Double-digit CPI, big upside surprise, a monster move at the front end of the yield curve in gilts, Tom. Yields up by more than 20 basis points, and I think that's the theme this morning. Yields higher in the UK and Germany, stateside too, and equities lower. The Nasdaq down by nine-tenths of one percent. Interesting to see how the Bank of England is represented at Jackson Hole when we travel there next week. John, in this hour... Like jobs report, like CPI report, I'm sorry, retail sales matter. It is a big, big print coming up in about 29 minutes. I'd caution, though, Tom, you've got to strip out gas. It's a month-on-month -month number. <clears throat> yes. Gas prices have come down. That's going to distort the number a little bit, so look for that. We need to try and gauge the underlying right. demand. So that's what I'd look for at about 8.30. And then, Tom, it's on to Jackson Hole next week. <clears throat> Andrew Hollenhorst, the city, just published. Please. And he said the risk is... Given the interpretation of the Fed meeting as dovish when he doesn't think it was, and given the easing of financial conditions that we've had over the last couple of months, which they think is unwarranted, the risk is that Chairman Powell has to be a little bit hawkish at this Jackson Hole conference, Tom, a week or so away. Well, we're data dependent as we go a week or so away. We just featured the Lucchese hat, the, res the Resistol hat that John is looking at uh, to be sure he's appropriately dressed for uh, that event. Kaylee Lines, target out. What did we learn? Well, we learned that they didn't set the bar low enough even after two outlook cuts. You still had earnings coming in well short of expectations, but we also learned that the reason why profitability was down so much because they had to discount in order to work down inventories. They think most of that work is done. Therefore, the back half of the year looks better. The question now, Tom, is can they actually meet those higher expectations through year end? The stock is down this morning on those results. Our guest is so important in the stock market now. John, let's get through the data check quickly here. I'm going to go to oil here where we've got a churn still. Brent crude 92 and American oil $86 a barrel. Crude down about a tenth of 1%, but the move is in the Treasury market. Yield yes. time by eight basis points to 288.58. I talked about that big move in the UK and Germany. Yield tire around the globe and equities lower by eight tenths of 1% on the S&P. Just a bad off session lows on the Nasdaq, but some weakness here. Though, TK, as you've said repeatedly through this week, this is how we started most days this week. Monday, Tuesday, yes. Wednesday, and then we've squeezed out a day of gains at the end of it all. A three 
day winning streak at the moment. Standard and Poor's futures negative 26 when Target came out. They now stand a bit below that uh, negative 33. We need to recalibrate as you do. We know the surveillance heads are spinning over all the different opinions. It would be good to get a strategy grounded in first order condition mathematics. That's Alicia Levine, head of equities and capital market advisory at BNY Mellon with some serious math chops. Out at the end of the algebraic function, there's an epsilon. It's a Greek letter. You and I used to look at it like, uh, what's that mean? Now it really means something. What is the systemic risk we see right now? So the systemic risk is that we've priced in the Goldilocks scenario, which is that the Fed manages to do the soft landing with inflation that's coming down on its own so it doesn't have to go that last mile from the 4 to the 2 percent, and that the consumer more or less stays healthy even as the Fed hits the labor market, job openings, but not actual jobs. That's the Goldilocks scenario. It is possible. But that's what we're priced for. We've now got the S&P trading at 18 times forward earnings as the 10-year move lower. And, and, you know, the risk is, of course, that that stickiness of inflation that you've talked about this morning is going to make things a lot more difficult. So, Alicia, how do you want to use that strength over the last couple of months? How do you reposition? What do you fade? Where do you fade? What's vulnerable? So I think that the, what's vulnerable here are the, are the stocks that have rallied the most. So when you think about uh, the, the long-duration tech stocks and the growth names, they've bounced back the most. It, they've bounced back because tens have, that tenures have moved lower. So I think there's going to be some sort of reversion to the mean there. I mean, I think that's what we've seen really all year when sectors have become overbought or um, oversold, they tend to bounce back. We're coming into the most seasonally difficult time of the year, September and October, with a, with a Goldilocks scenario priced in. Now, our investors stayed fully invested all the time. We don't trade around the market, so they, they participated in this rally. But we do think that the inflation stickiness is not going away anytime soon. So the minutes today... I don't think we're going to add anything necessarily new because you've had this panoply of Fed speakers that have come out over the last three weeks essentially trying to talk down expectations of a pivot. And all we've gotten is the tenure moving lower and lower and lower, financial conditions going going um, easier and, and, the, and tech stocks rallying. Alicia, Bank of America touched on this yesterday. And I'd like you to put it in English for us. They talked about us no longer being apocalyptically bearish, but we were still too bearish to get an immediate turnaround in the bear market rally. Can you translate that? Where's sentiment and what does that mean for the prospect of a further move higher here? So I, I think this rally took most strategists uh, off guard um, because the market was and strategists were essentially pricing in a recession as the base case scenario with earnings going lower. And what that means is that the risk is still higher because investors are still defensively positioned, meaning not buying duration and, and not really going all in on r risk trades. And so with that, you could see a squeeze higher simply because you've had a, such a huge structural shift to the defensive side. The real pain in this market, as terrible as the first five and a half months were, 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 were the accounts that were, were defensively positioned starting in mid-June because those positions got destroyed. So, you know, we tend to be very neutral. We tend to, you know, we tell our clients, stay Stay, stay fully invested because you can't trade it. Because when it turns, you're not going to get those upward moves. Alicia, you mentioned earnings there. And of course, we're at the tail end now of the second quarter earnings season. There's only about 30 companies in the S&P 500 left to report. And by and large, it's been pretty decent, at least relative to expectations. Average revenue growth of 14 percent, earnings growth of 8.4 percent. Both have been surprising to the upside more often than not. Looking forward, though, are we too optimistic about the trajectory of earnings through the back half of the year? So, look, earnings season has definitely come in better than feared. I think some of that was definitely um, the impact of inflation because earnings are nominal. So much better. And I think some of the, the, the retail reports we've gotten over the last couple of days have actually come in better than feared. Mm -hmm. And then with some optimism looking forward, I'd say this. I, I think that the fall in gas prices is really something very interesting because while – 
on one sense, it's it's disinflationary. On the other hand, if you're putting lower gas prices on top of an economy where workers are getting 5.5 percent wage increases, you do see that there's more spending power there. Um, and if July is better than June because of falling energy prices, then you have to wonder whether what, what direction inflation really is, is going in. If you look at new orders on the ISM, that tends to be predictive of where S&P earnings are going by about six months. We've been under 50 for a couple of months, and at 48, it tends to mean that your S&P mm -hmm. earnings will be moving lower in the next six months. We're just not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I were reminiscing. You were too young for it, but we were talking about the joys of turkey tetrazzini with a can of uh, cream of Campbell's cream of celery soup. There's a whole analysis going on now of the Dow Jones Industrial Average of the inflation now versus the inflation back when I was eating turkey tetrazzini at school. This inflation's different than that inflation, right? This inflation's different because essentially it's been driven one by commodities, but also on the service sector and the wage side. It's a different America. It's it, a different economy, right? Totally different economy. We're not manufacturing based anymore. We're a service based economy. And so when the inflation <clears throat> is on the services side, it's going to be harder to get it down. And also we're more heterogeneous. I mean, back then it was a more aggregated analysis and you can't do that now, which is where factor analysis is more important. Right? It, is, it is more important. I think the interesting thing to hear, to watch, is even as we've talked about the lower end consumer mm -hmm. struggling, it is completely obvious that the, the higher end consumer is not just doing fine. Spending, right. you know, in a profligate way, supporting the economy and supporting corporate America. And so I think that's different. Right. The, the range in income and what the, the effect of top line 9% inflation means is very different. Yeah, and John, uh, do you know Turkey Tetrazzini, John? Was I that an English I thing? I wasn't familiar with that, so I'm not. The big debate with You had to go to Brown for that. Yeah, the big <laughs> okay. debate with Turkey Tetrazzini is do you do put the soup in before the Parmesan cheese or after the Parmesan cheese? I'm just trying Parmesan to wind cheese, up, cheese. work out which part of this is winding me up, Tom. The, the meal or the Dow Jones reference with the meal? Or Back both. then, that's all there was. All fact, all still, that's all there is. Sure, no doubt. Where's the Dow now? The Dow now? Yeah, we're it's on with. down 186. There we go. Thank you, know, you Tom. Come That's on, we printed 34,000. Within the gloom out there, Alicia Levine has pu pushed against the gloom. We're 2,000 Dow points away from Nirvana. Point change on the Dow, Tom. You're killing me. Alicia Levine, <clears throat> Leon White Mellon, Wealth Management. The turkey Alicia. touch the Zini will kill you, awesome John. Awesome <laughs> to have you with us in the studio. The joke of the day, Tom, on Elon Musk. What would Elon Musk technology bring to Manchester United anyway? <laughs> They've been driverless for about nine years already. You only get that if you're a Man U fan, but that's from Tom Williams out on Twitter. Tom, what a mess that whole story is this morning. We keep joking about it, but there you it's are, one of the funny. richest men it's in the world. It's not funny. And you're joking about I, buying I, a public I, company and then saying you're joking. Why it takes does, you four hours to say you're joking. Why does I don't this, know. John, why does this guy have a different rule book? I don't get it. I don't, I don't get, get it. it either. I don't get why the stock's still up. <laughs> either off 5%. the back. That's the best story. Are the tots to publicly out. traded? I don't think so. We'll get you some st shares, Tom. We'll yeah. work that out. I'll talk to Levy some for preferreds. you. Do you think Levy will sort that out for you, Tom? He will. Just shout some stock. <laughs> Futures down 7 cents on the S&P. Yields up 8 basis points, 288. Retail sales in America, 20 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word news, I'm Leanne Gerens. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has warned civilians to stay away from military facilities occupied by Russian forces. That followed explosions at a Russian ammo dump over in Crimea. An advisor to Zelensky has said the blast marked the beginning of a series of attacks. Last week, explosions at a Russian airbase in Crimea did destroy fighter jets. Here in the UK, inflation jumped more than expected last month month to the highest level in 40 years. The consumer price index rose 10.1% in July from a year ago, following a 9.4% gain in June. That will put pressure on the British government and on the Bank of England to take action. In Wyoming, Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney has called on Americans to prevent Donald Trump from winning the White House again. Cheney suffered a crushing defeat to a primary challenger backed by the former president. She had become an outcast in her very own party for her 
strong anti-Trump stance. Target posted second quarter profit that badly missed estimates. Still, the discount retailer is sticking with its forecast of a dramatic rebound in the second half of its fiscal year. The profit plunge reflects decisions Target outlined in June to slash prices on home appliances, patio furniture and other discretionary items. And though has reported comparable sales for the second quarter that missed estimates, the home improvement chain was hurt by a slumping U.S. housing market and the highest inflation in decades. Earning were better than expected. Lowe's expects same-store sales for the year to be at a low end of the range of the forecast. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. I think the market probably does not move materially higher from here. I think 4,300 will likely continue to be a resistance. But probably the biggest takeaway is that maybe we don't have to retest the lows that we have seen of 3,700. That was Anastasia Amoroso, the chief investment strategist at iCapital. This morning, we're lower. Good morning. We're down three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, down eight or nine tenths of 1%. Seeing yields in the UK explode higher off the back of double digit <coughs> CPI. We're seeing a similar move on the German Bund curve. And on Treasuries, yields up by nine basis points on a 10 year, 289.13. The best piece of feedback I've had all week, Tom, has been on the Bloomberg B unit available on the iPhone now, downloaded <clears throat> as an app. Had a ton of engagement yeah. off that yesterday. So if you're a Bloomberg Terminal subscriber, it's available to you, Tom, on iOS. Yeah, really revolutionary. Of course, the B unit itself was revolutionary. I'm going to say 12, 15 years ago as well. This is a security system, folks, to log on to the Bloomberg Terminal, which is a valuable commodity. So Roy's working at that technology led by Tom Secunda Very right cool, now. Tom. Yeah. Very cool. People used to take this <clears throat> into a bar. You know, throw it across the table and let people well, you, know that you, you, they were important, that, bring up that their company invested with, real money in them, yeah. and they had one of these. Yeah. Well, what is that thing? There is that thing, and we say thank you to all in technology driving forward the terminal each and every day. Driving forward the retail discussion always is Dana Telsey. She's CEO, Chief Research Officer of Telsey Advisory Group, but far more than that, as no one in the game except maybe Vanessa Friedman at the New York Times, she is invested in the style and the fabric of retail America. Dana, I'm going to break a rule here. I usually start with big box or mid-market, whatever, but I've got to go to the fact of a surge in luxury goods. I see uh, LVMH 7%, maybe 8% from a record high. All the others are doing it as well. Is luxury an old story where you can't invest now, or can luxury continue to be a value for our viewers and listeners? I think luxury can continue to be a value for your viewers and listeners. Keep in mind, this luxury strength is happening regardless of the fact that the Chinese aren't traveling. So you haven't had travel from the Chinese. It's been the local Europeans, the local Americans, Americans going to Europe, where we've seen the strength of luxury. And certainly when we start to see the lockdowns decelerate in China and they start to travel, that's a benefit. And let's not forget that for the past two years with the pandemic, social occasions haven't been celebrated. So, yes, we have 2.6 million weddings occurring in the U.S. this year compared to 2.1 million on average. But even next year, there's going to be more to celebrate and the luxury pendulum certainly right. seems to be able to gain a benefit. And just as an aside, folks, I'm pleased to report that Kaylee Lines is going to 2.45 million of those weddings this summer <laughs> as, as well. Dana, let's bring it down market then from luxury as well. There's a mid-market, call it Kohl's. I'll let you decide. Maybe it's uh, Neiman Marcus. How's mid-market retail doing away from big box on the low end? I mean, mid-market is right there in the mid-market, but it's slower. I mean, every single company is, is talked about the fact that whether it was from late May or early June till mid-July, there are pressure points. The consumer stops spending. That consumer who basically is below $100,000 income was pressured by rising gas prices. All of a sudden, you hear them going to the grocery and they're trading down from potentially meat to chicken to pasta. And so the daily living essentials became more expensive. 
marry that with the fact that you're lapping stimulus, lapping child tax credits, and it, it definitely is a pressure point in terms of spend. Also, don't forget, we have a lot of inventory. The disruption of supply chain brought in goods <laughs> at the wrong time, and yeah. we're set up for continuing promotional impacts out there. On that inventory issue, specifically in Target's release, which John rightly pointed out earlier, the company's CFO saying the vast majority of our inventory right sizing costs have already been incurred. Do you buy that, that the worst of the inventory issue is over for these retailers? The costs may have been incurred, but the promotions are still ongoing. And what I'm still hearing from retailers is there's still a mismatch and we're still going to have certainly more goods available in September or October for these off pricers to benefit from. Dana, I just want to finish here. To what extent in luxury is it being propped up by some kind of shadow banking effort, buy now, pay later story? I see so many people wearing a brand that I just don't understand. It's Balenciaga. And I can go on a <laughs> rant about that another time. These are $1,000, $1,500 hoodies. They're $600 T-shirts. Dana, we're all told that it's a struggle right now in America, yet the queue, the line is right around the corner downtown in Soho. So, Danny, can you tell me, how are these things being paid for? So I see what you see, because I've seen those lines also, and how is it being paid for? And while it may not be buy now, pay later, it may be on credit card where they're just paying a certain amount every single month. Because what we've heard lately is even the buy now, pay later, some of those sales have moderated from what they've been. And we certainly know that what people are cherishing is they are cherishing those luxury brands and the sneakers. Every designer is making sneakers that are selling. Dana Tassi, thank you. Tassi Advisory, <clears throat> always brilliant. TK, it's so expensive for what it is. And I'm not signaling out um, a single brand. It's so many others as well. And yet, Seemingly, Tom, even if it's and Gucci, Louis Vuitton, you can do buy now, pay later on shops, Tom. I remember being a kid as a family. If my mom wanted to go in there just to look, you were given these evil stairs to walk back out because you couldn't afford the stuff. And these days, Tom, everyone can because it you can go in, buy the, now, pay later. I, I agree. It's a part of the merchandising where people are leveraging up on desires, particularly after two years of this. But, John, I'd say more, more than that. The oddest thing here are the margins that are generated and the labor required for these explosive sales, the labor models of these luxury companies are absolutely original. They're desperate to get craftsmen who can make the product. It's, it's a huge issue in Europe and particularly in Italy. Well, you're speaking of Hermes and the likes, <clears throat> particularly Tom or others as well. Well, no, I think Hermes has their, the Dumas family has their own approach, which is they are setting up leather manufacturing facilities, small ones, all across France. They have said, we're going to invest in France, and they're going to do this with hubs throughout many, many different cities and villages in France. That's one approach. It just seems to me, Tom, the consumer attitudes about these goods now has just changed. It's not about the price tag. It's about the monthly figure. I mean, I mean well, we see this with Lisa and Kaylee every day. I, mean, you know, it's, it's... <laughs> I blame Instagram culture. Do you blame it on that? Tell I us think, about yeah. that. Sure. I mean, you see these people who look just like you. They're about your age wearing all of these designer goods and you want to be like them. It's the impact of social media. Oh, yeah. I think it, it actually is economic. It's an economic force. Right. John, pro tip, the Balenciaga, the balance, I can't even pronounce it, the Balenciaga <laughs> sweatshirt, it will shrink in the dryer. We know this. I don't own one, but thanks for the <clears> heads up. You might buy a $500 hat, though. Down eight cents at 1%. Yeah, You're still uh, out. No thanks. <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. It is Retail Sales Wednesday. That's what TK's calling it. Mike McKee's going to break down that number for you in just a moment. Futures going into it, down 8 cents of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, down by one full percentage point with the yields higher by nine basis points. Call it 10 basis points higher now. With your economic data, here's Mike McKee. Good morning, John and Kaylee. Uh, the Fed is on the phone for you. You need to go shopping because retail sales come in flat for the month of July. No change in the retail sales figures overall. And the uh, retail sales control group, well, that one hasn't come in yet, but uh, X Autos up four tenths of a percent. And that is down from a 1% uh, move the prior month. And uh, X Autos and gas 
up seven tenths. So I'm guessing, and I'm just going to look quickly here, that gasoline played a big role in this. Gasoline stations down 1.8 percent, and we did see prices fall during the month, and retail sales are calculated in dollar terms. So uh, overall, that is good news. Motor vehicles were down 1.6 percent. John, we'll talk a little bit about that on the, the open coming up. Uh, furniture and home builders uh, d up just two-tenths of a percent after a uh, bigger gain last month. Uh, so it looks like uh, reasonably healthy in some areas. Building materials still up 1.5%. We saw those good results from uh, Home Depot the other day. Grocery stores just two-tenths higher. And clothing and accessories stores, these are the people who are not buying the Balenciagas because they were down six-tenths of a percent. Tom Keene helped out, though. Food services and drinking places up a tenth. Just a Good tenth, enough. though, Tom. you got more work to do. Food service and drinking places. <laughs> Futures down nine-tenths of one percent. Mike on the S&P and the Nasdaq 100 down one four percentage point. In the bond market, seeing a bit of response to this. So the front end now up by 11 basis <clears> points to 3.36 on a 10-year yield, higher by 10 basis points to about 2.90. Mike, I think the initial knee-jerk reaction here is to trade on the figure X gas for good reason as you just pointed out that comes in with a decent upside surprise the control group as well a decent upside surprise mike is that the right way of looking at this number strip out the gas I, figure month over month yeah i i think that's what the market is doing the re retail control figure which takes out gasoline and autos and home improvement stuff uh is up eight tenths of a percent those go into gdp and other areas and of course gasoline prices fell significantly, but the retail control group, which is uh, basically all the other stuff that people buy, was up reasonably well. Uh, the prior month had been at eight tenths, revised down to seven tenths, but still the two months together show Americans still were shopping, and that's why I think you're getting the higher yield uh, reaction, because people are thinking the economy may be a bit stronger. Of course, that means more work for the Fed. Hey, Mike. Looking forward to your coverage in the next hour. We'll break this down on Bloomberg TV as we run towards the opening bow. Down Tom, to the looking at yields, up 11 yeah. basis points on a two-year. On a 10-year, up 10 basis points. And this is what the street was focused on, the retail sales number, <clears throat> X well, gas because of what's happened with gas prices over the last month or so, Tom. And we get a decent upside surprise there. Yeah, very quickly before our steam gas, uh, 210 spread reinverts down to negative 47 basis points, not through negative 50, but nevertheless, that bears uh, watching the real yield is a little bit of a higher yield yield and dollar resiliency, dollar strength here as well. Michael Darda joins us, chief economist and macro strategist at MCAM Partners. And what's wonderful about his work is how he synthesizes the economic view into the equity belief. Michael, I'm not going to mince words. In my umpteen years of doing this, I've never seen the raging debate about the stock market linked to the mysteries of our economy. Do you feel the same way? Do you see record uncertainty out there? Well, Tom, one of the last times I was on in the dark days of mid-June, one of my messages for your retail investors was not to get too negative, even though the S&P 500 was down almost 24%. And, and the reason for that was it's notoriously difficult, probably impossible, to time market bottoms. And what we were seeing with the big decline in equity markets in the first six months of the year was mostly a rate shock, the 10-year yield going from 1.5% to almost 3.5%. Uh, but we're well off the highs in terms of the 10-year Treasury yield, even though the rates bumped up today with the good data. And the stock market is now up 17-plus percent from the lows. So the first six months of the year, the equity market decline really wasn't about negative GDP or recession or a big earnings crash. It was about a valuation adjustment as the 10-year yield moved up. And that adjustment is now mostly in the rearview mirror. I look, Michael at the view forward, and the view forward uh, ends with a thud. I believe it's on Thursday or Friday, Friday next week at Jackson Hole. What does Chairman Powell not want to do in his speech at Jackson Hole? Well, we've seen a bevy of recent Fed speakers out there with essentially the same message, which is that they're going to continue to persist in pushing the front end uh, of the curve up, meaning the policy rates and those rates most closely tied to it. And they're not going to be deterred. They expect some economic slowing, but they want to be very certain that inflation comes down and stays down and that inflation expectations stay anchored at low levels. So they're going to persist with the rate hikes. 
They're going to persist at a slower pace, though, and that's what the market has gotten wind of, and I think that's the main reason that we've seen this big equity market move off of the lows in the stabilization in the long end of the curve. The Fed can do whatever it wants with short rates. It doesn't mean the long rates are going to go along with it. So we're seeing an increasing array of yield curves move into inversion now. And that is a cautionary tale about 2023, but I think the mistake that some people made with the yield curve is that it's not an immediate indicator of imminent recession. It tends to be a long leading indicator. The bond market is simply saying the short rates are going to go up above three, but they're not going to persist there uh, for years and years and years because the economy won't be able to take it. So, Mike, do you think, though, that the easing of financial conditions we have seen are undermining what this Fed is trying to achieve? And how do you think this Fed chair is going to address some of that next week in Jackson Hole? Yeah, that seems to be the perception of some of the Fed speakers that are trying to push pretty hard against this idea of 2023 rate cuts. But they really have no idea what the 2023 economy is going to look like. I would say this, if financial conditions are easing because credit spreads are narrowing now from the highs and equities are off the lows very strongly, does that warrant more Fed tightening than would otherwise be the case? I would say only if inflation expectations are also rising in sympathy. Mm -hmm. But bond market inflation expectations are well off the highs and they've recently stabilized. And so I don't think that the recent so-called easing of financial conditions necessarily means the Fed has to be a whole lot more aggressive. If they choose to do so, then you know certainly that simply amplifies the risks of a of a downturn in 2023. Yeah. You know, that's a the FOMC see FOMC seems willing to take here because they really do want to ensure that inflation comes down, stays down at the and that those inflation expectations stay anchored at low levels. Well, on the point of those inflation expectations, Mike, which you've mentioned a few times now, we know a lot of that caters on the price of oil, which has come down, and that is reflected in those inflation expectations moving lower and in the retail sales data today with what we're seeing with the X auto and gas and control figures. Is too much predicated on pricing at the pump staying low when we had the OPEC new secretary general telling Bloomberg earlier today that he sees the likelihood of a supply squeeze this year? Yeah, it's possible. Um, you know, those break-even spreads do move around uh, based on shocks on energy prices and, and gasoline, but uh, it's not entirely driven by that. So there certainly is some interplay there. I really think the best thing the Fed could do here is to watch the evolution of nominal spending in the second half of the year. In the first half, nominal GDP was very strong, high single digits, but we didn't have much real GDP growth. I think that is going to change because it's not just energy. You see metals down very sharply from the highs. I mentioned the break-evens. We have a, a whole array of yield curves going into inversion, much slower money supply growth. So the whole front edge of the reflation and inflation and nominal GDP surge has rolled over. And so I think in the second half of the year, we're going to see slower and more appropriate nominal GDP growth on the back of tighter monetary policy. Mike, the path forward. What a complex one. Mike Dada there of MCAM Partners off the back of a retail sales print. Though on the headline number disappoints a little bit. But once you strip out gasoline, given what's happened with prices over the last month, you get a decent gauge of underlying strength for the <clears> U.S. <throat> consumer and U.S. retail sales. Futures still negative by 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P. But, TK, that move in yeah. the yield curve still there, up about 8 basis points at the front end on 2s, on 10s. Let's call it 9 basis points higher. Yeah, I think it's it's a constructive adjustment, which you know takes away from the gloom of recession as well. But it also shows the parts of America that are affected. I mean, if gas is a problem, that really affects low income, and that's what we've seen within low income at retail. John, you know we have an international audience. Maria in Brussels sends in a terse <laughs> email to correct me. Uh, it is a surveillance uh, break exclusive that Balenciaga. Did you know, John? From Spain, Crystal Ball. I, I got the same message, Tom, but I thought Sebastian. you called it Spanish. I thought we called it Spanish. I, I, I think we did, but sure. but maybe it was lost in translation. Where is Maria? I haven't seen her for weeks. I don't know what she's doing. She's like okay. on sabbatical. She's on halls. She's on halls. Yeah. On a long European vacation. Yeah, you know, it's the Spanish way. We've got to catch yeah. up with Maria today. Is that Spanish, Tom? That's Spanish yeah, too. She's probably long looking vacation. for me to make an acquisition of balance. Try and keep out of trouble for the rest of this week. Tom, the date is in now ahead of Jackson Hole. That's kind of it. For them, I wonder what kind of job they think they've got to do when they communicate I, I, next week. I think we're going to get in five different flavors data dependency.
I mean, I mean, that's all they can do. And they have to be data dependent, not because it's a theory, John, but because this is an original, all agree this is an original recovery because of a medical disaster. This is not normal analysis. Mike McKay and I started having the conversation yesterday, Kaylee, just as a suggestion maybe that this easing of financial conditions yeah. is undesirable for them and perhaps there's <clears throat> going to be a big coordinated effort to push back. Well. Yeah, it's not what they want to see. They want to see those tighten, and especially for Chairman Powell, who for whatever reason was perceived as dovish in that July press conference, whether or not that was his intention, does he now try to correct that narrative in a big way next week? This market hasn't looked back since the middle of June. Kaylee, awesome to have you with us. You back tomorrow? I am, awesome. all week, John. And Friday. And well, that's going to be back next get week. Back. It's a one-day hold. Ramos taken a one-day hold, Tom, that turned into a long weekend. Mm -hmm. okay. She'll be back on Monday before we go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for the Fed's annual symposium. Looking forward to it. Coming up at the Open, we'll catch up with Peter Chu of Academy oh, Securities, Elise Ossenborough, JP Morgan, Keith Lerner of Truist Advisors. We'll do all of that as we guide you towards the Open and Bout. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word news, I'm Leanne Gerens. China is warning the U.S. not to sail warships through the Taiwan Strait. The Chinese ambassador to the U.S. said Beijing views such actions as an escalation by America. The Biden administration has said it would send warships and fighter jets through the strait. That is after China responded to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan with a series of military exercises. Now, Goldman Sachs says that a deal to revive the nuclear agreement between Iran, the EU and the US is unlikely to reach a deal in the near term. The firm predicted that even if there is a breakthrough, additional oil from Iran won't start to flow until next year. The US is looking at Iran's response to a draft proposal of an agreement. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange is forecasting a pickup in IPOs next year. CEO Nicholas Agazan spoke to Bloomberg TV. I feel confident given the, the, the number of like IPOs that we we have in the pipeline. We've had, you know, 16 IPOs in July. I mean, so very, very, very good performance. Now, we had all those IPOs and the pipeline still around 180. So the pipeline was replenished. The Hong Kong's exchange net profit fell 27% in the first half of this year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Raising taxes to spend money on infrastructure means you've got to trust the people doing the spending. And I think the public-private model is the way to go there, which is actually create an infrastructure bank uh, that is U.S. public company owned or pu pu public sector owned that has private sector matching funds. I think that sort of breakthrough has yet to occur in the United States. He is the chemical engineer of Queensland, greatly associated with Brisbane, where he will lead the Olympic uh, effort of 10 years out. Andrew Livers, you know him from Dow Chemical, of course, and now in one of his many affiliations, Lucid Group chairman. He'll be interviewed by David Rubenstein. You'll see that tonight at 9 p.m. Peer-to-peer conversations with Mr. Rubenstein, and he joins us this morning to speak of this really most interesting guy. And what's great about Andrew Liveris is he's really hardwired into the hopes and beliefs, the prayers of an American renaissance in manufacturing. Is it for real? Well, he thinks so. He thinks that the manufacturing uh, <clears throat> loss we had in textiles and other kinds of things that were dependent on labor costs is not relevant for the future of high-tech manufacturing. He thinks we can be a, a leader in high-tech manufacturing because that depends on supply chain and, and other related things, not so much on the cost of labor. But Andrew is an incredibly diverse uh, person in his interests. He's from Australia, of Greek immigrant background. He ran Dow Chemical as president for, and CEO for 14 years, merged it into DuPont. Now he's the chairman of Lucid Motors, which is an electric vehicle upscale car. Mm -hmm. He's also an advisor to the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. He's also on the board of Saudi Aramco. And as you note, he is also the chairman of the Olympics for uh, Brisbane in 20, 
32. 32. Right. You and I can't think out that far. Right. We're right. going to be here for it, though, David. Well, I swear. Uh, Kayla, you know, I, lo- I look at this, and, and so much for me, Andrew Liveris is about process. He's the process guy in American business. Yeah, and he's trying to build something with this EV company in particular. But, David, obviously, when we talk about EVs, the comparison always is to Tesla, who in many ways, Elon Musk was a first mover on this. How does he see <clears throat> them competing, whether or not they realistically can? Well, Tesla is designed to produce cars, I won't say for the average person, they're, they're not inexpensive, but they're not going after the luxury market. At the moment, Lucid is really going after the luxury market. Its cars begin at over $100,000 uh, per vehicle, and they go up from there. Um, they will get, address the lower cost market later on, but right now they're focused on the upscale market, and that's why they're not directly competing with Tesla. Well, and of course, the U.S. has been looking at making more investments into the EV infrastructure space. That's part of what we see with the clean energy spending in the Inflation Reduction Act that the president just signed yesterday. What were his thoughts on U.S. infrastructure policy, what it ultimately needs to look like? Well, Andrew Liveris has been involved in advising several presidents on infrastructure spending. And now that we have a bill, Hopefully, there'll be appropriations behind the bill. Remember, the bill was early only to authorize spending. We have to actually appropriate the money. But assuming it's pro- appropriated, we can begin to redo some of our bi- bridges and roads and, and toll roads, airports, and things like that, which should make um, EV cars uh, more accessible, too, because they're going to build out a fair amount of electric uh, charging stations throughout the uh, country. Uh, David, I have to turn to the issue at hand, and I know these are delicate discussions. You don't want to talk specifically about the Carlisle Group, but I do want to talk about scale and heritage. Dow Chemical of Andrew Liveris is 35,000 employees, and I've never bought the idea that big companies have smooth transitions. It can be as challenging as any. Carlisle Group is roughly 1,900 people. One of the great challenges we've seen in smaller projects, hedge funds, alternative investment, private equity, venture capital, is a generational shift. What's your best practice on that? What's the best practice to say, I want to move on and do this, 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 your, your exceptional philanthropy to the American people and our history? How do you make a generational shift? There's no perfect model. Uh, each of the firms have gone through it in different ways. I think a good thing to do is to have somebody who's been at a firm for a long time, part of the culture. They know the ethos of the organization, and gradually they come in and take over control, and the founders step back. But it's more complicated than a typical situation. So let's suppose you're Lou Gerstner, you're the CEO of IBM, right. and you retire. When you retire, you don't own 20 or 30 percent of the company still, and you're not still, uh, you know, a major mm-hmm. investor in the funds. It's a different situation. You're not a founder. So all the founders of the large private equity firms are still involved, uh, largely with some exceptions, still involved in, in as owners, investment committee members, right. and as big shareholders. And it's a little different than the Lou Gerstner situation or Jack Welch situation when they retire and they don't really control the company yeah. through the, the ownership of large shares shares in the company. Thanks for those comments. David Rubenstein here, of course, uh, continuing the Bloomberg coverage of what we see in all of these different firms as they make generational uh, moves. Mr. Rubenstein with the full interview of Lucid Group's chairman, Andrew Livers. That's tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, in New York. Kaylee, I look at where we are in the retail sales, and I'm sorry, it's a resilient America. Yeah, when you factor in the price of gas at the pump coming down, Tom, that really is what is borne out because it was unchanged on the headline month on month. But when you X out auto and gas up more than expected, the control group up more than expected. And really just energy prices is the theme of the day because it is working here in the United States with prices at the pump coming down for the American consumer. Over in the UK, factor in higher energy prices and you're looking at a 10.1% print on inflation this morning. And you see the move in the gilt market as a result of 24 basis points on the two years. I'm not going to miss words, Kaylee. I think the, the double-digit print in Spain was one thing, but a G7 nation with a double-digit print changes the dialogue at Jackson Hole. Let's remember that's an international meeting and not just about Jerome Powell. Yeah, I wonder who has the easier seat right now. Jerome Powell at the Federal Reserve or Andrew Bailey at the BOE, considering the now market expect the market now expects 200 basis points of hikes by May. Wow. Not quite the pricing we see for the Federal Reserve. That has come down since the July meeting. How much is Jerome Powell going to have to push back on that? And do we get some insight into that in the Fed minutes at 2 p.m. Eastern today? And further curve invasion here, or inversion, I should say, over the last 48 hours, we come down to negative 46 basis points. D 
seemed unimaginable really two, three, four weeks ago, and there we are, maybe to come down further inversion through that negative 49 basis point level. Futures at negative 37. Dow futures deteriorate negative 218 with a VIX really not showing much yet. 20.48 off the 19 level. A little bit of angst in the market. Don't want to oversell that. Dollar resiliency, and we, sh we saw that off better than good retail sales. Please stay with us on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Welcome back to another Western and Southern Open update for Bloomberg TV and Radio from Tennis Channel. I'm Jamie Maggio. Cincinnati said goodbye to a tennis legend as Serena Williams went down to the reigning U.S. Open champion Emma Raducanu. Williams recently announced that she'll retire from tennis after the upcoming U.S. Open. Despite the loss, fans in Cincy gave the 23-time major winner a standing ovation as she left the court. To be honest, I was nervous from the first point to the last point because I know what a champion she is. She can come back from any situation, so I really had to stay focused. And uh, yeah, I'm just so pleased that I managed to keep my composure. Raducanu moves on to face two-time Aussie Open winner Victoria Azarenka in round two. And don't forget Tennis Channel's daily live coverage from Cincy starts at 11 a.m. Eastern. I'm Jamie Maggio.